So uh, I'm Brian O'Hara. We're here for a vegetable culture extravaganza. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, vegetable growing and a lot of the intricate details about producing vegetables in a modern condition. So uh, we have a farm in Lebanon, Connecticut. We grow several acres of vegetables there. We grow vegetables year round. And we have been doing that for about 30 years. We rely on the farm for our income. So we're very tied to our farm as our livelihood. And it has created uh, the need for us to be very attentive to our production system in order to uh, make that profitable and uh, keep the family uh, 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 gainfully employed in an agricultural pursuit. So that's my background. And uh, so basically, I've spent my entire life growing vegetables. And so uh, what has happened over the course of those 30 years is that vegetable growing 30 years ago was a relatively, oops, oh boy, oh. let's go the other way. Vegetable growing. Uh oh. Well, one thing that you should know about me <laughs> is that I have absolutely no technological skills whatsoever. And uh, I wouldn't know the first thing about how. To help. All right, you need that or anything? <laughs> <sighs> yep, PowerPoint, there it is. Ah, beautiful. All right. And so I rely on the kindness of strangers often. <laughs> and uh, so spending all my time growing vegetables and being just a little too old for the technological age, I missed a lot of uh, uh, technology and how to work with it. Luckily, I have people that support me to do this, and they help me put together slideshows and uh, you know, do my print uh, article handouts and things like that. So, uh, so vegetable culture has become much more difficult as the environment has uh, deteriorated over the last 30 years. And so it was basically a very easy pursuit at the beginning of our careers has gotten to the point where it requires more finesse in order to successfully produce crops uh, of a high quality without the use of pesticides. And so, and we haven't used pesticides for 30 years. And that would include any kind of organic pesticides. So what that, what that has always meant is that the crop has to be in a very healthy state. The, when the soil and environment are fully functioning, the crop is of a, a sufficient vibrancy that uh, it in inherently reduces or eliminates the ability of insects and diseases to prey on it. So <clears throat> with that basic pursuit of high quality and lacking the use of pesticides, our focus has always been on soil quality and on vegetable qualities. So that is, that's how we got down this road of uh, taking care of the soils and taking care of the environment and being very, very focused on attentions to details in order to achieve that. The pesticide is the shortcut, obviously. Uh, basically what happens, and this is a problem in modern food production, is that as the environment is run down, the crops are poorer and poorer of quality meaning they have less and less of the nutrients necessary for healthy humans. And they, uh, when, they, when the crop gets into that kind of a rundown state, the pesticide is the fast, easy answer. The pesticide, of course, adds to the toxicity of the poor nutrition of the crop. And so the food quality has steadily deteriorated decade after decade. So uh, in order to keep the, the vegetables in this kind of a, a, a insect and disease resistant state, 
uh, requires that we really uh, study and observe primarily with uh, observation in the field. We spend a lot of time with very, very focused attention on the crop. We obviously gather information from conferences and articles and books and uh, uh, scientific assessments. But by and large, the route for us to uh, success has been very close observation of what happens in the actual field condition. So let's start looking at some of those field conditions. I think at this point. So basically the farm is very, very intensive. We have uh, about three acres of vegetables under cultivation. And all of those plantings are very diverse and very, very closely spaced. One crop goes immediately into another, so that each piece of ground grows at least two, if not three or four vegetable crops in a given season. So three acres cropped with two crops over the season, say as an average, is actually a six acre production. So the intensive nature of the crop production is aligned with how vegetables are grown in the vast majority of the world. Most farms in, say, uh, China or Africa uh, in other regions where it's a much smaller scale agriculture, vegetables are raised in basically, you know, two to five acre uh, blocks, all maintained by families for their own sustenance, and then excess is grown and sold off into the marketplace. So it's pretty much the standard in the rest of the world to operate intensive, small-scale uh, farm operations spe specifically focused on vegetable production. Uh, and that is how uh, large volumes of people are fed off of small acreage. So, for instance, we've had Chinese agriculturalists come out to the farm, and they assure us that this is what China looks like. Just farm after farm, millions of them, uh, just all right next to each other, two to five acres. And that is how they have fed those populations for all those centuries. And what is interesting, you know, the, the famous uh, writer, F.H. King, who went over to the Orient in the early 1900s to observe Oriental agriculture, uh, uh, corrob corroborated that scenario. But in his uh, very influential book, Farmers of 40 Centuries, <clears throat> what he was documenting was that the farmers in China had been on exactly the same ground for 4,000 years and their soil fertility and crop production was equal to or better than any point previously. And so that was, he, he, he put that up and juxtaposition that against Western agriculture, where the Western mind in our agricultural pursuits had burned out the Middle East, North Africa, Mediterranean, Europe, come over to this country, burned out the East Coast, moved out West, and the Dust Bowl was setting in. In, in the West. So he, he, he was trying to understand how they could maintain that fertility for that long of a period of time. And it had to do with intensive scale, largely vegetable focused production with the family on that piece of ground and the soil fertility being their primary pursuit in life. So it's a model that's been around for a very long time, and we find it very successful. And we find that in America, with, as times are changing, that this is what is blossoming in our region. The, as the land is being chopped up uh, into smaller and smaller pieces, people are opting for smaller and small, pr smaller production systems. The small production systems are largely human-oriented. 
not machinery oriented. So it relies on a, a lot of human effort. And uh, so it, it, it has its uh, differences with the management of human effort than uh, taking care of machines. However, it is uh, very uh, resilient in uh, both an, uh, an economically turbulent environment as well as a climactically turbulent environment. When we're growing every crop, uh, complete, we grow every single vegetable. And we, when you grow every vegetable, uh, your chance for large-scale loss is greatly diminished. If we were just a potato farmer and something happens with potatoes that year, uh, it can be very ruinous to your over, overall livelihood. But every year, because there's always problems every year, every year something's going to go wrong and something's going to go right. And so, for instance, this year with all the rain, you know, uh, watermelons did great. I thought they needed more sun, but great bumper crop of watermelons. Turnips did great. Uh, peppers, of all things, did great. Other things, absolutely terrible. Uh, potatoes went underwater and rotted. We had carrots rot in the ground. And the rutabagas failed. Why a rutabaga would do poorly when a turnip does fantastic, I'm not sure. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that we observe and we pay attention to. And every year is going to be different with different difficulties. So by diversifying, you can uh, really uh, take the good with the bad and overall end up with a successful uh, year despite extreme challenges, such as this last year. I mean, probably most of you, I heard up north it was actually dry, but anywhere south of like the Vermont border, or even up a little higher, it has just been constant, constant rain since July and cloudiness. Uh, so let's go ahead a slide and see what we've got. Yep, this is more intensive vegetable production. These are just some slides showing the intensity of the production. So this is watermelons between asparagus and corn. Uh, the watermelons actually had uh, crops in between, like arugula or radish or something, maybe was in between those very fast growing crop that was pulled as the watermelon vines sprawled out onto their uh, growing area. Uh, Flower gardening is a, a beautiful thing for us. We incorporate that into our growing. My daughter takes care of the cut flower production. And here is cucumbers and corn and some chard. Similar situation where another crop was just pulled out of here and now the cucumbers are going to sprawl down there. The cucumbers are going to go growing underneath the corn, possibly even grow up the corn stalks a bit. But these are just to give you an idea of uh, the, the intensity of production. And, there obviously out there'll be numerous more slides about showing how intensive the production area is. But uh, I really want to start out with focusing on the soil and the growing environment. Actually here, I would like to just give, yeah, I'm going to give a, just a quick overview of how we came to a lot of our uh, conclusions about taking care of the soil from a historical perspective. And that is, you know, since we have uh, such an interest in the health of the crop and taking care of the soil, we have studied soil texts from, well, probably over 100 years ago to the present time in a lot of detail. And we've looked at a lot of different agricultural methodologies from the past to in order to, to take care of soil qualities. So basically, uh, when you can read a manual from the 1800s on soil quality or something like that, and it's uh, basically aligned with organic principles and taking care of soil because the chemical agricultural revolution had not happened yet. So uh, it wasn't until obviously the early 1900s or probably mid 1900s really got rolling that there became a split essentially, in uh, taking care of soils from an agronomy standpoint, let's say, uh, that uh, divided the agronomists into essentially two camps. 
uh, at first it was very heavy. Most agronomists were following a chemical fertilization uh, routine. And then there was the organic method and its proponents. So uh, there was a division and the organic method came from that division. Uh, some of the early pioneers in the 1930s and 1940s uh, came up with the alternative version of not using chemical fertilizers, using organic matter as the primary fertilizer material in the fields. Or, that's where organic gets its name, obviously, is from the use of organic matter as the fertilization material of choice. Organic matter being carbon-containing uh, materials that were once alive. So, or are still living, really. And so in 1930, when the organic movement got rolling, the organic matter that they would harvest from the environment was of a balanced nature uh, in terms of its mineral profiles, its uh, nutrient, you know, its other compounds that were in it. It's, you know, uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is the plant life in 1930 on the surface of the earth was in a relatively healthy state, at least compared to now. And so when you took organic materials and you combined them and used them as your fertilizer material, you had a beautifully balanced fertilizer in 1930 by making compost with uh, these various organic materials. But what has happened, at least as far as I'm concerned, is the, the modern organic matter of our present world is dramatically imbalanced. And it has become increasingly difficult to take the organic materials from a dying forest or a poorly treated agricultural land and compost them and expect to come out with a really high quality compost material. So, uh, with those changes in hand, it has become more necessary to pay attention to uh, minerals and uh, the composting process itself in order to amend or work with a material that can function well in the modern environment. So in other words, uh, there was this division of organic and chemical. Uh, and there was animosity for a long time, but now I think that the, the, the future moving forward is a combination of being able to work with the chemical agronomists and getting some input from them and the use of mineral materials, primarily from stones and things like that, which are not organic in nature, and combining them into a mineralized uh, compost-based fertilization system. So in, in, just in terms of uh, uh, that division and recombination, I, I, I do feel that that is very true. The agronomists of old, you know, were so vehement about, you know, anti-organic and vice versa. The organic people were so vehement against, you know, using chemicals. And, but, you know, as time has gone on, you know, they've, They've decided that, you know, both people have a few points that can, can be taken and combined and, and used to better our agricultural systems. So, and what do they say in agronomy? Uh, oh, no, it's academia. Uh, academia uh, progresses uh, one funeral at a time, you know. It takes a little time for uh, the science and academics to move along. But I think that day has come, you know, the new agronomists and people in the universities are so much more open-minded than uh, you know, a few decades ago. So on top of that division of the organic and the chemical uh, realms, you know, there were some really other important uh, soil movements in the past. One of the most important that we really uh, appreciate tremendously is biodynamics. Both the, the agronomy mindset is you know very chemically based and very uh, often science based you know building from the bottom up prove this move on build something bigger off of your previous uh, assessments uh, whereas biodynamics 
it works from the opposite. It's the holistic viewpoint where it takes, you know, the entire creation from the cosmos and brings it down to your agricultural setting. Uh, so basically, it, it, when we look at holistic thinking versus scientific thinking, I'll juxtaposition those against each other at this point, you know, and I'm going to talk about generalities right now, but uh, basically I'm going to talk about generalities through this whole presentation. The thing about farming is that it is very less than exact and to have general understandings and general principles and a, a generalized outlook as opposed to a very scientific exacting uh, attitude uh, generally pays out much better. Uh, it, we are in a science dominated culture and it is very easy to get sucked into exacting things and to do things exactly and build them exactly. However, when you're running a farm, uh, generally there is so much going on and so many diverse factors and so many uh, changes that need to be made on a constant basis that if you allow your mind to go into that state of rigidity, you are gonna be less than successful and profitable in your crop production. The, the farming mindset that, uh, I mean, perhaps it's just of these times in particular, but needs to be one of extreme flexibility and the ability to change your mind, even though, yes, you want that to be perfect. You want to finish that project. You know, there's this, all oh, this, you know. And in general, I found over the years that it, it, flexibility is just probably the most critical uh, change that I needed in my mentality in order to really move with the way things are changing. So uh, now getting back to the holistic view versus a scientific view. So oh, the, when you look at everything uh, from the cosmic arrangement of planets and the moon influence and how the earth was formed and then uh, and you have all the you know, influence of the wind and the, and the, and the stars and the you know, soils and the sun and uh, that's what we're working with in farming. And that is a very big picture. Uh, so generally, oh, see too much talking and not enough slides, is that what happens here? Do you, do you remember how you, you fixed that last time? Yeah. went out of uh, the, the program by itself? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe the time's up. Yeah, time's up. More slides. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, it's the button. Yeah. What button? Something. Are you clicking on just those two? Yeah, well, there's this little, I haven't used that one. Uh, you should use these two. Yeah, that too. Um, Try it again. All right. All right, let's see how it goes. Okay. So holistic thinking is what biodynamics excels at, looking at the whole picture, looking at natural systems, how they work together, looking at the influences as it all churns together. Not a strong point of science when you're talking about living systems and all the influences uh, that are going on. Oh, no. Yeah, I think, it's I think we might need a tech guy. I can't keep coming yeah. over here and doing this. I'll call him. I'll call him. Okay. It's just this thing you down here in the in the bar. Uh huh. And then you go to PowerPoint. I'll get the guy. In there. Okay. Thanks. Uh. So. Uh, biodynamics offers that holistic viewpoint and you know, tremendous amounts of details about dealing with natural systems. And, but also, which is really, I greatly appreciate, is it is a spiritual aspect, a spiritual view of dealing with uh, farming and crop production. And I'm just gonna wait, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, 
So, all right, so I'll just keep blabbering for now. And so the spiritual incorporated into the physical is really what we're talking about. You know, when we're dealing with uh, natural systems, this is all, you know, God's creation. And you think it's better off now? Oh, thanks. Ah, kindness of strangers once again. Uh, oh. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I can just talk for a minute and because I wasn't really going to. We're going to start hitting slides in like about 10 minutes, and then it's just going to be all slides for a long time, you know, until our break. We'll take a break and stuff. This is just kind of intro. So I'll just keep talking about the inter introductory uh, to soil assessment, essentially. So biodynamics offering that spiritual approach to agriculture. And so basically, you know, Rudolf Steiner was a great leader for the biodynamic movement, but he was very, he's very concise and he was very uh, eloquent about describing how the spiritual forces manifest into physical materials. So they just transfer out of the spiritual state into an energy state, into a gaseous state, into a liquid state, into a solid state. So in, in that process is just going back and forth. There's consolidation and unconsolidation as uh, the spirit moves in and out of form. And so uh, to have that spiritual outlook and an understanding of what we're really working with is very useful. Uh, things have become like right now, uh, everything is consolidating. Rudolf Steiner talked very eloquently about how this time, this period is a period of co concentration and things were going to become very hard and rigid. And that is exactly what's happened in our forests and our crop production is that there's uh, become a very brittle, we're in a brittle environment. Everything breaks, the trees fall down, the crops break apart. Everything is very, very concentrated into a very uh, unliquid state, let's say, a very solid state in the materials. I can, I've been cutting trees in spring that I can throw right into the wood stove. Uh, the sap content of things is very diminished. And so we're in a period of a very concentrated concentration of period, which leads to uh, rigidity. That rigidity is not only in our crops, it is in the human, the human rigidity. It's all a reflection of uh, the state of the earth, you know? And so, again, that's why I spoke about flexibility, is because there's this huge tendency for rigidity, everything uh, becoming very, very firm and solid and uh, unflexible. So to use our minds to control that, to remain flexible in an imbalanced condition, is also uh, very important for crop production at this point. Uh, so... That's probably good for biodynamics, but I want to just talk about some other, I mean, I could talk all day about biodynamics because it is a fascinating, fascinating uh, subject. However, another methodology that we utilize is called Korean natural farming. And that came out of Korea, obviously. And it's, a, it's kind of a natural farming movement of the East. And there was a lot of very useful information coming out of Korean natural farming, particularly of a biological nature and how to use biological activity in your uh, crop production system, all coming from a very traditional Korean uh, uh, farming uh, outlook, which is usually small farms, small vegetable production, very uh, uh, biologically centered. The whole culture is very, uh, that ferments a lot of foods and uh, very, very, oriented towards small scale fertilizer preparation on their farms. So we'll talk about Korean natural farming as well. And uh, so that's, I think the background is where most of our methodologies and background come from. And it uh, seems like we're, we've got this uh, working better at this point. So why don't I get on with, let's talk about the specifics of soils and environmental conditions. So basically, the soils 
what we're looking for in vegetable crop production is very much mimics what is the soil in a, in a forested condition. So when you look into a forest and you reach into the soils, uh, there is undecomposed organic matter on the surface, uh, decomposed organic matter underneath that. Then you get into a more mineral topsoil material, which has some of the organic matter uh, brought down into it. However, uh, not nearly like the thin layer of compost, essentially, that is on top of that mineral layer. And then you get into, uh, generally around here, a, a subsoil that is different than the topsoil. Uh, ex uh, ex extreme layer difference between subsoil and topsoil. And so that's our standard soil in the forest. And so that's what we mimic in the field, is an undecomposed organic mulch layer on the surface, the compost uh, beneath that, and then the uh, uh, topsoil layer, subsoil below that. So what that requires essentially is not tilling the soil, which I'll talk about in detail, but by not disturbing the layers of the soil, the soil biology is able to bring those nutrient sources into the soil at the rate that it uh, requires and desires. Humans, basically, we, we underestimate and do not treat natural systems as delicately as they would appreciate. Uh, the, to take a compost in this, say I came in here with a tiller or a plow and I turned that top material into the soil, not only would I kill a bunch of those earthworms, but you would basically force foods down the throat of the soil and require that the soil decompose those materials in a more immediate sense. And all kinds of things go awry when you start trying to over manipulate and ask too much of nature. So it nature at this point demands a gentle treatment. Nature previously was very forgiving and would allow us to do tremendous uh, detrimental things in a natural setting and still come off with a successful crop production. That is by and large not the case anymore. Now, that, uh, simple examples of that would be when we first started farming, we kept honeybees, we produced maple syrup, we grew vegetables. By the 1990s, the honeybees had become so unprofitable because they constantly died that we had to drop the uh, beekeeping honeyside uh, production system of the system. By a few years ago, the maple trees are so dead that they no longer put out sap in Connecticut, in our region, and we had to abandon the maple sh uh, syruping production. Both those are examples of things that we counted on nature to provide us for. Uh, nature is no longer capable or willing to provide us with those things. In other words, we did not manage where the bees foraged for the honey or nectar that would make the honey, nor did we uh, control by and large, the soils that all the sugar maples grow upon. And so now our farm is oriented only on the soils and environment that we can specifically influence and control and work with nature to have a, a, a beneficial relationship. So what that means is, of course, uh, nature has taught us a lesson that nature demands better treatment because nature is not going to give us those foods anymore. The chestnuts have died, uh, our oak trees are all eaten by caterpillars and dying all over the place, the nuts are no longer in the forest. Uh, so nature is withdrawing, the blackberries don't fruit anymore, nature is withdrawing its, its offer to us and we have to now prove essentially that we are willing to work in harmonious beneficial relationship with natural forces in order to create our food and our livelihood on our farming. So uh, the, 
that requires, you know, as I said, a very uh, forgiving approach or a very gentle approach to working with the soil microbiology, you know. And so let's see what we have next here. Basically, what our soils have come to look like are uh, a very uh, kind of black color, dark, very dark color soil, which, of course, it was very, very light brown when we initially started these fields. These fields were in terrible agricultural condition when we, when we started out farming here. Uh, very, very poor soil qualities, uh, just fields of poison ivy and wild blueberries. So we have converted those to a very living soil, which has a, a very dark color to it with a, a very nice aggregated crumb structure. And what that means, and also this is a good example of both earthworm activity and the fungal activity that you see on the straw pieces there. What that means is that the soil can effectively function. This soil is not effectively functioning. This is a corn lot next to one of our rental fields. And it was harvested in uh, October when it was extremely wet and they brought very heavy equipment onto this field and had to harvest that corn off for their livelihoods. And they, they left it terribly rutted with heavy equipment ruts all through it, which compacted the soil. And the soil is eroding and uh, crusting itself over very rapidly. So this is a picture of erosion. As some of the water is moving through the field, you can see that uh, it looks like a river. Obviously, it's a tiny little picture. But it's uh, essentially moving all the fine materials out of the field and eroding away the topsoils. The topsoil is smeared over. There's no signs of earthworms. There is uh, no way for the soil to breathe. So that is the juxtaposition. There's a rut that I made uh, along the side of the field the other day, simply by driving a truck uh, through a, over a wet sod. And this is an example of how water can no longer penetrate into that rut. So when we're working with soils, what we want is to be able to create conditions where the biology is thriving. So what is going on in the case of crop growth is the crop is uh, rooted into the soil with a large uh, mass of roots in the soil. The soil, uh, well, the roots are exuding the byproduct or the sugars uh, created through photosynthesis and other materials through its metabolism. And it is exuding those materials out of its roots creating a material, a gelatinous material, that surrounds the root hairs uh, in a region called the rhizosphere. So around each root and root hair is a gelatinous substance, which uh, that is very nutrient rich. And the soil biology thrives in the rhizosphere and creates an interface between the mineral portions of the soil and the actual plant root itself. So in organic agriculture, and this is why it's traditionally been so successful, and uh, is this interface of a, of a living soil biology that processes the mineral fragments of the soil, uh, you know, interface, interconnects with other soil microbiology, and brings back a nutrient flow to the plant in a symbiotic relationship with the plant and the soil microbiology. So there's this back and forth flow. The plant is feeding the soil biology. The soil biology is feeding into the plant. The soil microbiology is providing 
nutrients in a complex form. So the, 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 the plant is not simply absorbing a nitrate molecule. The plant is absorbing much more complex molecules that contain nitrogen in them. So the, the plant is able to absorb uh, already processed uh, nitrogen sources, like, uh, say, an amino acid. And so if the plant is able to absorb an amino acid uh, from a living biological system in the soil, it is able to uh, not have to go through the full metabolism to create that amino acid itself, which saves the plant tremendous energy. So basically, if you look at it in the wide kind of view, the the biological systems feeding uh, more complex molecules into the uh, plant living system is saving that plant the metabolism and energy required to create these compounds on its own. Just one tremendous benefit of this interface between the plants and the soil biology. So that ability to uh, take in those complex molecules versus obviously a chemical agriculture relies much more on soluble, uh, smaller molecular compounds that can feed directly into the roots, potentially also of benefit for uh, specific uh, reasons. However, by and large, the more complex molecules allow a fully functioning metabolism in the plant. So the objective of a fully functioning metabolism is quality. So when the plant is in a high state of function, it is able to create more and more complex molecules that are of a very nutritious uh, nature for us. Antioxidants are very complex, uh, very other, you know, vitamins, uh, you know, pigments, uh, very, uh, the, a lot of the flavor compounds that we associate with a good tasting vegetable. Uh, so, and basically with plant metabolism, I'm sure most of you know, but basically what's going on, you know, the plant creates a sugar from photosynthesis, simple sugar, and then it, it uses the sugars that it's creating from photosynthesis as an energy source and a building block to create more and more complex molecules. So it'll turn a sugar into a complex sugar and it'll turn it into a carbohydrate all through uh, enzymatic reactions. So the enzymes are the catalyst to uh, a building program in the plant. The enzyme is a protein itself, but is, uh, I think all, always has uh, a, a metallic, a metal uh, element as its basically central element that uh, the protein is kind of built around. And so many trace elements, things that we don't consider necessary or very, very small doses of uh, these elements are in those enzymes. And so the enzymes, uh, when you have a full uh, fertility and a nutrient delivery, the plant is able to create numerous, very diverse enzymes to process this building uh, material from one molecule into another of more and more complex nature. That is how you get down the, to the insect and the disease resistance is because it, for the plant to have that level of metabolic function, then the insects and diseases leave that crop alone. And I cannot tell you how many times I have seen that replicated over and over in our field and other fields I go to. A healthy functioning plant is almost has such small amounts of insect and disease resistance. I won't say none because that's not really what goes on either, but the, the vibrancy is obvious 
Uh, once you get a good eye for it, you know way beforehand whether a uh, vegetable is going to get an insect or a disease attack simply by how it grew and what it looked like. So uh, that looking for that state of vibrancy is what you uh, can develop an eye for, and then all your other trials and efforts work towards developing that state of vibrancy. Hey, do you think we could open that door, get a little air in here? So uh, the, I discussed the enzymes that are basically come from a lot of trace elements. And trace elements, by the way, are one of the hugest losers in our natural systems due to pollution. So pollution is just wiping out, leaching out trace elements, damaging the soil microbiology so that the, those important trace elements can't get into plants. Uh, so trace elements are a huge loser uh, in terms of the modern condition. So, and what happens is that if the plants don't have those trace elements available, they won't create certain enzymes. And yes, they can still live and function, but their whole molecular makeup becomes skewed from what would be normally considered a healthy, vibrant uh, crop. Because if, it, if down here it didn't have this amino acid to create this uh, specific molecule, it cannot build the further molecules down the road. And the plant will substitute in other metals, but it skews the whole profile of its amino acid profile or its antioxidants or its basic makeup of molecules becomes skewed if the plant isn't capable of creating all the enzymes it needs for a fully functioning uh, metabolic system. So anyway, when you get down the road and you have insect and disease resistance, you actually have everything. It all goes along with it. You have taste, you've got flavor, you've got uh, long storage qualities, you've got insect and disease resistance, you've got bright pigmentation, it all goes hand in hand. And so really the customer, all they need to know is that their taste buds will guide them to the crop that is going to provide for their nutrition and health. Every human is walking around with their quality meters right in their mouth. And so, uh, and that is also the key to marketing. We have spent zero, zero, zero time marketing over 30 years of agricultural, uh, commercial agricultural growing because simply the, the people respond, even if they don't even conceive of it in their mind, their bodies are like, I need that carrot, you know? And uh, so the, it, is, you know, it can be the color, it can be the fact that they ate one last week, uh, whatever it is, but so uh, it is really so, not only, it's, not only is it the key to you know, nutrition and health, it's also the key to marketing and uh, customer loyalty. And uh, so anyway, just so you know, it, you, when you get it, you get it all. So now let's look at how do we create those conditions in the soil and what are we up against? So the soil being uh, of a largely biological nature, as I was saying with the rhizosphere, needs to uh, Uh, that, that, that microbiology needs to be very carefully cared for. And I'm just going to discuss some of the basics of how that uh, needs to happen in terms of some of our overall management. And then I'll get into the more specifics like no-till or weed control or fertilizer usage or compost usage and things like that uh, later on. But let's just talk about the general environment. The soil uh, being probably the most important thing that we work with as farmers is uh, uh, made up, of course, of the mineral fragments of, of the rock that has decayed uh, underneath us, combined with the organic uh, fragments, which are basically the mineral element incorporated into living uh, systems, and uh, air and water. And the air and water in the soil are actually the primary uh, fertilizer materials, really. Uh, the plants are made of air and water. They, 
you know, they burn them down. They're like, oh, you know, the plant is 5% mineral fra fraction or, or something like that, you know, whatever various, you know, studies have done. But uh, essentially, the plant is made up of, of air and water, which is, you know, what the, the plant utilizes for photosynthesis to create those simple sugars. So the management of air and water is really primary in crop production. And you know, it doesn't matter what fertilizer you apply if your air and water uh, has not been properly managed in the soil system. So the soil, when we, talk, so when we start talking about air and water in the soil, they're in complete interrelationship with each other. The more water that's in your soil, the less air that's gonna be in the soil and vice versa. So, you know, it's, it's basically called the pore space that is between all the soil particles. And so we're looking for a very balanced water to air ratio that is best achieved by natural forces. You know, you certainly can get in there and farmers always do get in with uh, tillage equipment and churn that soil about, introduce air, irrigate it, and, uh, you know, manipulate the air and water in the soil to a great extent. However, uh, nature does it way better. And forests, you know, they don't go dry in a drought unless the drought is really bad. And that's because it has a functioning air and water and biological system. Uh, our soils very prone to droughts especially under a tillage system. So basically, let's look at water first, moving into the soil. So water, of course, oops, wrong way. Water, yeah, let's look at water first. Water moves, I had to do that picture there. Water moves into the soil from basically into the topsoil from two directions. It comes down out of the sky or from irrigation equipment, or it moves up from uh, the subsoil layers and, and the earth's inherent moisture. So when we, when we manage for water, when we're trying to encourage water into our soils and say we need water, uh, the soil surface in a crumb aggregated structure like that allows rainfall or irrigation to move into the soil. The pooling of water, the, the, the compacted nature of this field and the poor agricultural practices have smeared this soil surface. So when water falls on this field, it turns into those erosion, little rivulets there, and erodes away this field and water cannot penetrate into that field. Not that this field needed any more water, but uh, they say it would look very similar if this was to suddenly dry out. It would be crusted over and maybe have some cracks in it, but this soil is not going to suddenly aggregate. It is going to go from this uh, smeared, soggy surface into a crusted soil surface that does not allow air or water to penetrate into the soil and therefore feed the microbiology. The microbiology is alive, it breathes, it's, it's, it's in the animal kingdom. And so it requires oxygen. Anaerobic organisms can uh, get oxygen under less oxygen rich environments, but essentially the soil biology is breathing. And so uh, for it not to be able to get air for it not to have a, a water source during dry periods uh, severely damages the very biology that we are counting on to have that interface to feed our plants. So to keep the soil uh, breathing and hydrated is absolutely critical. The soil biology in a functioning state when they breathe, they inhale oxygen just as we do, and they exhale carbon dioxide. So the, the soil is uh, going through a breathing process just like we do. And so this soil is exhaling carbon dioxide 
carbon dioxide is a heavier component of air and will sit more towards the soil surface where the plant canopy is right over that soil surface. The stomatas for the plant are on the bottom side of the leaf that allow for the carbon dioxide to be uh, inhaled by the plant, which then allows for photosynthesis to effectively happen. So the very carbon dioxide that is going to end up as uh, a photosynthesis sugar is being produced by the living soil biology right underneath the plants. And the plants are, and everything is timed in nature where the, the plants are inhaling, the soil is inhaling and exhaling exactly at the time that those stomatas are open and are inhaling their uh, carbon dioxide. Everything in nature, and so is very, very intricately timed and very, very complex. And so the, uh, to, to, to interact in those natural systems, you know, requires very delicate care. And that is also true of, now let's get back to water, that the aerobic anaerobic cycling in the soil itself. So there's some organisms that can deal with a lot less oxygen, the anaerobic organisms. The anaerobic organisms have a certain impact and a certain nutrient extraction out of the soil versus the aerobic organisms, which extract certain uh, elements from the soil and have a certain function in the soil. They are also in an interrelationship. So the, they go through a cycling where the aerobic organisms will function primarily and extract. However, they'll build up to a level that they then diminish themselves in the, because of a low oxygen environment. Then the anaerobic organisms come on uh, and do their work at a, in a certain cycling. And then the anaerobic organisms decay back and the aerobic organisms come back up and function in there. All timed very specifically. Uh, in a cycling nature that would also interface with way, the way plants need to absorb nutrients. So it's all very, very complex and very, very cyclic in nature and, and very uh, effective at keeping uh, the, the plants growing on our soil surface. And so for us to just go bludgeoning through there with plows and rototillers and harrows and all kinds of heavy equipment is like just like barbaric you know, uh, conditions, chemicals, you know, all. Uh, so it is best to allow the soil to function itself through very specific, careful care so that those cycles are happening. It would be very difficult for us to, uh, to determine when these anaerobic and aerobic conditions, let's take an irrigation event. Okay, the soil and earth's conditions have created a specific uh, need in the plants that the microbiology is functioning to, whether they've created an anaerobic condition or aerobic condition at a specific time. We as farmers, we're like, ah, oh, the soil needs irrigation. And that may well be true. I mean, something may well have happened that, that you know, it really needs irrigation. But you have just intervened. You laid down a bunch of water when the earth itself was not expecting a precipitation event. And so nature now has to readjust itself to your action. And so uh, the less we disturb uh, natural systems, the more effective the natural system can function. So uh, we want to set up conditions in our crop production where we don't ever need to irrigate. You know, natural systems will be sufficient to keep that. You know, obviously it's not, you know, we irrigate when necessary and things, but by and large, you want to set up conditions where you can allow nature to do exactly what it wants to be doing at exactly the time it's supposed to be doing it. So in terms of water movement into the soil, you've got you know, penetration through an aggregated soil surface. I would point out that the aggregation on the very top inch is much more, allows for much more air, but then the next couple inches that are aggregated as well are more are smaller and the air space is less and then you're into a mineral uh, organic uh, layer that our subsoil layer in our case is uh, certainly more compacted because of its nature of its particulate matter. Well, that is all very specific, you know, for the biology of this, that, is, that is there. If you come in and you flip all those big crumbs down deep in the soil and put the 
mineral on the top, you know, everything has to readjust, you know, and that is all wasted time in terms of crop production and keeping the biology functioning for that specific crop at that specific time when you want it in place and in an in a energetic high state of functioning. So uh, the aggregation allows for the water to move into the soil, that it, but at the same time, that crumb structure on the surface quickly drains out. It's not like the water's going to linger on top or pool on top. It's going to move right into the soil, get to where it needs, and flush out what is excess. So the soil in a natural state is doing all that. It's regulating the amount of moisture it contains, and whether it's excessive or it needs more or less, it's, it's very self-regulating. So uh, the, the, the very organic nature of the soil also allows, and I'll talk about this during uh, fertilizers and things, but also keeps moisture highly available and does not dry out. In other words, you want the soil to basically be a sponge. And so it's porous, allows water in, yet remains wet for a long period of time when necessary, but allows air in at the same time. So all those factors are what you're looking for. Uh, it is also a sponge in the nature of that it wicks moisture upwards from uh, the depths of the soil. So if you have come in there with plows and harrows or other tillage equipment, they invert heavy equipment like uh, uh, this picture over here. Uh, compaction. So compaction happens through machinery traffic uh, that has squished that soil profile really deep and uh, happens invariably with tillage equipment. So a plow or a harrow or a rototiller, when you put them through the soil, it will smear the soil below. And what that means is that it has compacted that soil uh, to a lower, uh, at a lower uh, profile. So the, when you're plowing, the weight you know, the push of the soil to flip that over is pushing that plow against the, the soil below it. A rototiller spinning around, it is smashing the soil against the soil. It is not churning. And so all the harrows do the same thing, a down compression in order to churn the other stuff up. Anything below the tilled layer is compacted. And that is referred to as a plow pan, uh, which is a compacted layer below usually excessively aerated air area. So that uh, plow pan creates a barrier to water, also air. So the, the water cannot move upwards through the plow pan, and water cannot move down through the plow pan, and so sits on top of it after a rain or an irrigation event. That so the water pooled on top of a plow pan will create anaerobic conditions, uh, which lead to you know, excessive anaerobic conditions that lead to a toxicity in the soil as the anaerobic organisms create many toxic compounds from their metabolism. So often you'll, you know, you think everything's going great, you irrigate, you get heavy rainfall, but if you got a plow pan in place, you know, your roots start to rot, you get less nutrient release and everything goes wrong. Vice versa, the tillage event, which over-oxygenated the soil uh, and made it unhomogeneous anyway, even if the water could make it through that plow pan, a tillage event would degrade the inherent structure of the soil so that the moisture can no longer effectively move up as if the soil was a sponge. So the to not create the conditions of a plow pan are very critical to the functioning of the water movement through the soil. Soil compaction also happens, in this case, it's relatively obvious, where uh, under an erosion event or say a rototiller event, all the fine molecule, uh, fine particles of soil move. And so all the fine stuff is moving off here, further sealing where it settles here, 
but often in the case of say a rototiller event, you've churned up the soil, uh, rainfall happens, irrigation happens, all the fine particles in that destructured soil move straight down and they hit that plow pan and so it causes basically a kind of clay or fine particle smearing as well. As, uh, as well, of course, those fine particles could really have been of benefit in the upper layers of the topsoil, but you've moved them down by excessively churning the soil. So uh, those are some of the primary things to think about when you are dealing with uh, uh, soil in water, in soil air. Let's see, what else can we talk about there? We've got uh, erosion, yeah, erosion covered there, uh, smearing. Okay, so let's talk about drainage now. So often agricultural soils in our region are too wet. And in general, we get too much moisture on a lot of ground here especially this year, we're probably heading for a record uh, precipitation event. And so generally a lot of soils do well to have additional drainage applied to them. Certainly everything I spoke about uh, previously is of primary concern, but uh, to deal with uh, high levels of groundwater in vegetable fields is also very useful to keep in mind. So. Generally, you've got two conditions, two, two things you, could, you can do to help get excessive moisture out of our inherently pretty wet soils. Uh, and that is ditches or subsurface drainage, which essentially are ditches that have been dug and pipes put in them and then uh, stone and then uh, soil put back over the top of them. Uh, pretty common, you know, on our wetter soils in the region. Our soils are pretty poor here in general because of the level of precipitation that we've gotten here for all these centuries or millennia. Uh, basically, uh, we're in kind of a low nutrient soil area, not the worst in the world, but you know, all this rainfall has created these conditions where we have a very uh, acidic soil uh, leached pretty well leached. I mean, obviously we had the glaciers come through and kind of churn things about somewhat, but it's, it's pretty leached damaged soils, only exasperated by the modern conditions of acid rain. And of course now we're getting ever more rainfall. So Tav and I, you know, you might want to put, you know, your ditches or uh, your subsoil, that's a subsoil drainage pond, uh, just ditches on the field edge. They can get the water table down to a reasonable level. Vegetables in general don't do well with wet roots constantly sitting in water. Uh, so that's just, I wanted to cover that quick so that you guys could think about getting some additional air in there. Okay. And so, I think what we're going to get into next is uh, I'm going to get into the no-till and how to not till the soils. Actually, I'm going to talk about how to get started right from the beginning. We're going to do tillage. We're going to take a break, actually. We're going to do tillage, uh, and then I'm going to talk about no-till. You know, in other words, how to get the, it started. Right, we're going to, right after our break, we'll, we'll start with uh, prepping a field with tillage equipment how to get in the best shape with tillage equipment, then I'll flip into no-till, then we'll start talking about compost, soil fertility, uh, biological inoculants, and things like that maybe after lunch. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's about it. You guys, uh, let's take a break. How, I don't know how long, it's almost, it's like 10 of, maybe it'll take like a 15 minute break or something, get ourselves some oxygen, and uh, then we'll hit plenty more. If anybody didn't get their handout, we have all the handouts back there, big thick thing with lots of information in it. And uh, yeah, and if I miss anything, you guys can ask a question too, you know, especially if it's an important thing that I've been missing and uh, you know, while I'm talking and things like that. But hopefully it's concise from one, one, one 
part to the end, you know, beginning to the end. All right, we'll see you guys in about 15 minutes. All right, yeah. Get into tillage, and I'm hoping to take you at, at this point straight from preparing the field straight through to harvest. Now, you know, we talked about soil, you know, but I'll talk about some other subjects like compost and fertilizing, things like that, but I'm gonna try to make it so it's like a progression from uh, start to finish with vegetables. But I do want to talk about pollution because I have some great slides uh, of a very uh, kind of disturbing uh, uh, situation. I think this is just, uh, oh yeah, yeah, oh, this, uh, this was part of the wind discussion. And so basically I, I discussed, you know, management of the solid earth. Uh, I discussed management of the liquid water. Uh, and now, uh, and I discussed air to some degree, uh, but another important aspect when you think about air management on your farm is air is uh, essentially very much, it functions in the environment very much the way uh, water does in terms of its movement across a piece of land. Like you saw that water moving across that field. Air is really doing the same thing. You just can't see it as well. But it is, so for instance, this is to the west, and we have a large pond to the side there. Uh, it's much larger than this photo shows, but we get a very stiff western wind coming across this farm. Uh, but there's a wind break for you know, the upper two thirds of the field here of these evergreen trees, uh, which is very useful for wind management. And so that allows us to grow winter vegetables much better because that we're not battling a stiff winter wind the whole time, possibly working against us in the summer in humid conditions when a stiff wind would clear out uh, and dry things and get that moisture moving out that would be excessive and causing uh, potentially leaf diseases and things like that. So liquid air and wa water and air management isn't just about how you manage them in the soil, it's also about how you manage them in the upper environment as well. So to think about air movement and to think about water movement across the land is very important. Like, uh, you know, these beds are against the slope. The, each, the, the slope is downhill that way. You see that the bedding area is against the slope. That keeps the summer when it rains, the water will move, can't just flow down. If we aligned the beds the other way, and water could just shoot right down uh, on the wheel track or where you walk, it becomes compacted. And so the water could move down readily, but instead we have put the beds against the slope, not 100%, however, the beds are slightly uh, not quite against the slope. So if it becomes excessive, the water can drain out over the, the course of time down the wheel track. Uh, we'll open those up again in a second, I guess, after break is over. Did that one just close on us by mistake? Okay. Yeah, a little bit of noise. But, uh, keep some air flowing going through. So, uh, yeah, air and water. You know, so we're talking about airflow. So, uh, to, to align the bedding system, and essentially what happens uh, with the beds is they are shaped by a tractor, although eventually we don't use a tractor much. Uh, there's still essentially a raised bed where there's a wheel track to walk in and then uh, a little raised area. And that area becomes a, a possible to pool water or move water on and off the field to a larger degree. So to, the way you site the bedding you know, it's very important. You know, crops generally are grown for us. We use a bedding system as opposed to a row system of just one row here, one row here, one row here. I'll show you plenty of examples of that. But uh, so the way the beds are arranged and then how the air moves across that. So we put these beds against the slope, but ideally they would for wind movement and drying, it would actually be better to have them the other direction where the western wind is blowing along the beds to, in order to dry them during uh, wet periods. So sometimes you've got to, you know, do whatever is appropriate for your addition. You don't necessarily 
be able to get exactly what you want all the time, but it is very important to consider these overall concepts of how to lay out the field in order to maximize the air and the water conditions in the upper atmosphere. Um, yeah, so the windbreak is there. And uh, so th I think the next thing for me to talk about is the sun, because we've discussed the other three elements of crop production. However, first I'm gonna show that I'm not just making this up. I mean, there's millions of trees dying in Connecticut. And so I just took a picture of, you know, the Sunday New York or uh, Hartford current. Uh, you know, trees are dying all over the place. And, you know, people don't really notice, but, you know, they don't notice much uh, of anything these days. So uh, it is a big problem. And so we're going to get into the no-till now. So this is a nice cabbage crop. But uh, I've got a bunch of pictures of the trees and the sunlight condition. So this is the forest around our farm. And yes, we have caterpillars, gypsy moths that come through and eat the trees. However, in general, the canopy of the forest is now open like this and sunlight penetrates and there's grasses starting to grow in the forest because the trees don't have leaves, basically. You know, they have much less uh, foliage. It's much smaller foliage and it does not properly pigment. And uh, so here are dead trees that have died this year. You see they had little leaves, but they just up and just died away. And so here's some trees that just died after a few years of, of gypsy moth and diseases. Uh, this, this just shows a very weak canopy. This was not gypsy moth damage. These are trees that are just steadily defoliating. Year after year, there are less leaves on the trees. Uh, Here's an example, we had a sudden spruce die out. So this is my neighbor's uh, spruce trees, which you know five years ago were full spruce trees. Now they're all just in a complete state of collapse. Uh, this is showing, you see the defoliated tree up there. That is the state of our sugar maples that we used to tap. Again, gypsy moths, you know, there's some on the maples. They're primarily on the oak trees. Very, very poor canopies, discolored incorrect coloration on the trees. Uh, here's a picture. You can see the diseases setting in on the, the sugar maples. Uh, on this side of the field, see the brown trees. Basically, all the trees turn brown. Now, we have very little pigmentation for years, just year after year, always brown, all diseases on all the trees. Uh, this is an example of a healthy sugar maple where we uh, culture the uh, biodynamic, uh, indigenous microorganism culture that I'll talk about later. So this is basically being uh, biologically inoculated. And, but it does show what an, uh, a sugar maple canopy should look like in the proper coloration of the tree. Uh, however, by you know, not even into fall, but this is what I look at. You know, on a, on a daily basis, there is no coloration. All the trees, brown, defoliating, very uh, small, few leaves. Uh, uh, here's spruce trees next to our house, which, you know, you know, 10 years ago were just green, dense things right to the ground. And so here's the ash trees. Oh, this has got the chemtrail in it too. So I got the ash trees, trees with the chemtrail. Uh, but you can see, you know, again, not gypsy moth damage, just uh, the ash trees, you know, there's an ash borer around. These ash trees do not have the borer. I've cut them down. There's no borers in them. The borer, just like I discussed, uh, insects and diseases attack unhealthy crops. The, the borer is just coming along because the ash trees are dying. Uh, they've been dying for decades. I've watched these things just get worse and worse every single year. By the time the borer gets here, they're going to be dead anyway. Uh, so terrible canopy, leaf diseases every year, never pigments, uh, gonna die really soon. So uh, now I get to talk about chemtrails, but let's, uh, let's I just wanna review the overall environmental condition. Just that, uh, you know, I've been in the same place for 50 years. I have watched that chestnut trees die out, the elm trees die out, the 
red pines die out. I've watched the, all the spruces are dying or almost dead near me. The sugar maples die out. I've watched the honeybees and the pollinators die out to an extraordinary extent. I've watched a bat die out. I've watched uh, there's less frogs, there's less turtles. I have barely any uh, Canadian geese. Everything's quiet. There's less songbirds. I have watched everything die. And it is, uh, it is not, you know, it's very poorly understood and people are afraid. But everything is collapsing all at once. You know, there's this idea and the scientists, you know, they're very, you know, they, they don't have a holistic view, but it is very obvious to me that the entire ecosystem is dying. It's not that there was all of a sudden Dutch elm disease. It's not that there was a bat fungus. It's not, they even know what's killing the bees, right? It's, it's that there is an overall decay that cannot support life. And so uh, that is very important for a couple of reasons. And the reason I'm bringing that up, well, one of the most important reasons I'm bringing that up is because you've got to have your eyes open if you're going to do crop production in this environment. And if you cannot see that these things are happening and you cannot internalize them, that that is what the environment is now, it means that you probably can't pay enough attention to really get the gist of what you're going to need to do. So it's very important to meet your fears and be able to have your eyes open to be able to see what needs to be done when it has to happen. So as I said, now we rely on our human effort interfacing with natural forces in order to achieve a state of crop production and health in this uh, collapsing environment. So the ugly side of that I just showed you where nature is, is having serious difficulties. Now the beneficial side of that is it has made me a better farmer. It has got me out here talking to you guys about this kind of thing. And nature is giving us a huge signal, essentially, that uh, we've got to work in a more harmonious relationship with natural forces. It's an undeniable, straightforward signal that is going to keep pounding us until we get it. And that is how the humans will finally change to being in a, in a more uh, conducive state with working with our earth and our natural systems. It's only going to be when nature makes it so blunt that that is our only option. So unfortunately, uh, so that's a bright side and I see beauty in coming on. You always get both. You know, you get terrible ugliness and terrible beauty all at the same time. And so, you know, that's what we've got going on here. You know, we've got this, you know, catastrophe around me and then this beautiful development like what we're doing up here and the way other farmers are functioning in their fields and, and soil conditions. Now getting, getting into the sunlight and human uh, interference and uh, uh, the system that has created the economic system that you know we're presently functioning under that is I mean you could blame the economic system for the collapse of you know nature you know, but obviously the economic system is just uh, an extension of the human state at our at this present point. But you know, obviously exploitative capitalism is an easy target to say. Well, you know, if if everybody wasn't out for the bottom line, trying to get squeeze every penny out of nature and squash their fellow man, you know, nature might look better. But you know, it's probably a little bigger than that. But the uh, I would point out, because I'm going to talk about the, all these jets and these chemtrails blotting out our sun, that uh, certainly the economic system is not about to stop. And the economic system is going to seek ways to continue to do exactly what it's doing right now, to keep exploiting everything to the maximum degree. And it is not going to allow uh, concerns over nature uh, to get in its way. So uh, previously, when I was younger, I, was, I always thought, oh, you know, nature, when nature finally really signals us, you know, then, we'll, then, then things will start changing. The, the, this, the system is only intensified in its level of control, and it is going to continue to do so. And so uh, it is not likely 
that all of a sudden, you know, government policy and uh, the, the capitalist economy is going to be like, eh, let's start taking care of nature because, you know, uh, we need to do things that don't pollute nature. No, more likely they're going to try all kinds of technological modern trickery to continue their program as usual, which does seem to be what the heck these things are about. Now, I'm not, you know, obviously I told you I'm not even on a computer. I don't know anything about, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the details of what people are saying about these things. But what has happened on our farm in the last three years is that all of a sudden these things have showed up that I have never seen the likes of before. Uh, I could take hundreds of pictures of these things. You know, I have hundreds of pictures of them. They, these things are every day where I live. Uh, and so this blots out the sun, you know. These things, they don't stay that size. They turn into this white haze that uh, completely has obliterated the sunlight in my region. Uh, you know, it is extraordinary in their, in their extent. And so this one is a picture of how, you know, they, they turn into a white haze. Uh, here's them through a white haze with a chemtrail right through the sun. So now when I look at the sun, it is always through a white haze like this. Uh, just constant, constant, constant. And now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Here's chemtrails in the sunset. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, that was just all natural coloration. I was so impressed because I don't really have good camera skills or anything. But the, the, the camera actually was able to take a picture of it. I was like, wow, that's great. Uh, so now, and this is, I consider this a feat in my photographic abilities too, because I went up to my local cell tower on top of my hill and I was able to capture chemtrails with the cell tower with the decaying forest and the barbed wire, all in the same picture. I was like, oh, that is just awesome. <laughs> yes. So, uh, okay, and then the pollinator died out. So basically, I'm not going to spend a long time on weather control, but because, uh, you know, I don't, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, because the government says, nobody denies that the sun's blotted out. You know, obviously the sun is blotted out. There's, you know, all these things through the sky. So the official excuse that people tell me is that jets, they're just more jets and they have to burn more fuel. And that that's all of a sudden why, you know, the sun is blotted out. But the sun is indeed blotted out. So that's EPA or somebody saying this kind of thing. Uh, however, I think it would be naive at this point not to think that the governments are heavily involved in weather control. Uh, uh, when I was a small child, you know, they ran uh, in elementary school, they showed us scientists from the black and white reels of, you know, uh, the scientists laying down silver iodide, making clouds, making rain. The scientists standing up there in 1962 saying, kids, we're going to control the weather. Uh, they were very excited. Uh, that was 1962, and now it is, you know, 55, 60 years later in technology is through the roof. Weather control is incredibly important to the military. We are in, in constant state of war. Uh, other nations are actively using weather control. Arabia is trying to get uh, rain. China is all over weather control. Our government cannot be involved, uh, cannot not be involved in weather control. Other nations, it's a state of war. We are in a state of war. They use weather in warfare and competing nations are using weather control as well. So I think it would be naive not to assume, uh, the government you know, has admitted that they, they are actively cloud seeding over the Rocky Mountains you know, uh, for more snow and precipitation. Uh, and of course, one of the, one of the most primary proposals uh, for global warming is uh, solar radiation control through the use of particulate matter in the upper atmosphere. They've been talking about that since the 1980s. So, you know, whether or not this is intentional or, or not, I do not know. But it, I think that it would be very naive to think that there is not a lot going on with the weather, particularly 
when we look at the season that we just went through where there was little to no sunlight. Now, the sun is critically important to our crop production, even before all of this business. You know, I read scientists in like the 1990s, they were talking about that the pollution, the particulate matter, had blotted out the sun by about 10% over the 1950. So if you, the sun is the source of energy and life on the surface of the earth. If you knock back the sun 10%, you are going to have 10% less photosynthesis on the earth, less of everything. And so the more the sun is blotted out, the less the life can function. So, you know, I would just point that out that obviously uh, uh, the sunlight is our primary source of life. So, you know, sometimes, you know, people are like, well, you know, you kind of get downtrodden that you can't control the government and that, you know, they're totally out of control and they're doing all this kind of thing, military, blah, blah, blah. It, and again, it's, it's the same as what I was saying. I, it's, it's irritating to me, but at the same time, it is not primary. The jets are going to go away eventually, and we're still going to be here trying to grow crops in a modern environment. So kind of keeping the long, long haul picture in view you know, really helps with, you know, temporary conditions of what we've got to tolerate so that we can keep moving forward to keep ourselves in a healthy and happy state of, of mind while we're functioning in a polluted environment. So the polluted environment has reduced, like this is an early spring pollination uh, crop that was raised for seed. It is Mizuna. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, this would have been like standing next to a beehive. It would have been so active. It's so early in the season. It's such a massive floral source. There was so many insects on these crops uh, 20, 30 years ago. Now there is a few flies buzzing around this crop is the level of insect collapse. The uh, tremendous reduction in all kinds of insects. It's not just the pollinators. It's just all kinds of insects have died out. So, but it all gets back to, you know, the, the pollution and what we've got to deal with now. So our sun is blotted out, okay? There's more precipitation, there's more rain. Uh, the rain that occurs, uh, uh, you know, is this basically essentially a distilled water raises up into the atmosphere, forms clouds with dust particles in the upper atmosphere. The dust particles that rain now forms around are primarily leftover jet fuel or whatever the hell else is getting put up there. Uh, but regardless, what used to be essentially a, a fertilizer material, because the old dust before industrialization was primarily sea salt, which is an excellent trace mineral fertilizer. Now the primary dust up there is, you know, these half burnt hydrocarbons and other uh, pollutants, aluminum, God knows what's going on up there. And so the, the, the water rises up, grabs these particulars, and then falls down through a gaseous environment that is a, a very high in other pollutants, uh, like nitrogen, a lot of nitrous oxides and very volatile nitrogen gases, also carbonic and sulfuric uh, compounds, volatile ones, oxides and things. So as the, as the rain falls through this disturbed gaseous environment, it picks up all these other acids, uh, as well as, uh, one of the primary pollutants uh, is uh, herbicide residues, all blowing out here. We've got thousands, my soil lab guy told me, Brian, you should probably consider you have 5,000 miles of glyphosate blowing right at you. Okay, that all those, they've, worse herbicides now. Okay, the herbicides have just gotten worse. Those all vaporize when they're being applied, go into the upper atmosphere and blow over here and rain down. So the rain, which used to be a perfect fertilizer material, now comes down as an herbicide-ridden, uh, polluted, uh, acidic, uh, uh, natural event. So that leaches our soil and damages our soil profile, it damages the soil microbiology, and it damages our forests. And along with the blotted out sun, voila, collapse, okay? So uh, it is very important to keep that in mind because as I said uh, earlier, when, when the organic method was come out with in 1930, and they said use organic matter uh, to fertilize your soils, that was not the situation. 
Now the situation has severely deteriorated and we need to pay a lot of attention to what we are putting into our soils. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Obviously taking the, the, the residues from that forest that I showed you, leaves and wood chips, uh, is not, it, it didn't grow a sufficient plant in the forest to just take those materials and compost them and expect to get a healthful crop out of your field is probably not going to be tremendously successful as well because they're obviously nutrient deficient. Okay, so that is uh, more or less my quick uh, discussion about pollution and why we have to pay so much attention to uh, all about what I'm, what I'm about to talk about. So I've talked about soil and the importance of the soil and that is primary still, but there's a lot of other things involved too, which I discussed. And these are my soil pictures, which I need more of. Uh, a primary indicator for us of a functioning soil is uh, fungal growth in the field. So I love to see mushrooms sometimes in the field. Uh, so when we are under a tillage system, because that's exactly how we started out, we would rototill between each of those crops. We were rototilling several times a year. Uh, often uh, and pulverizing our soil or, and just severely damaging our soil through excessive tillage, we would never see mushrooms in the field. Now that we have a, a, a much more balanced approach, uh, we get to see a lot of fungus growing in the field. And obviously not all fungus has mushrooms, but again, it's just an indicator that fungus is actively functioning in our soils. So. Let me talk about bacteria and fungus for a minute. So the bacteria and fungal ratio. Uh, so many things in natural systems have a lot to do with balancing, you know, two different kind of entities. And in this case, I'm going to talk about fungal to bacteria ratio. You know, in composting, you'll talk about carbon to nitrogen ratios in uh, water and air, you talk about the air and water ratios, and basically the, uh, it's kind of like the positive negative, the yin and yang. Uh, there's often two forces in opposition and collaboration at the same time. So uh, with that kind of view of conditions, it's much more, again, a broader view than just saying you need this much fungus and you need this much bacteria. If you just took that without considering their relationship, it would be very difficult to arrive at the right balance. And so nature wants to self-balance, but we certainly assist nature. Oh, and that is uh, particularly one of the, the high points of working with all this kind of thing, is that uh, nature loves to work with us. Uh, the human we have incredible abilities to make nature more fruitful than if we were not here. Nature would survive on its own, uh, but the human with our capacities and our knowledge and our abilities, we can help the earth to be more fruitful, more life-giving, more beautiful than if we were not here. And so that's kind of like our, our promise and our duty as to humans and of humans is that we have this incredible ability and responsibility that, and, and something, you know, a duty that is so rewarding in our lives that is uh, the, the mantle of which is so easily taken up. And uh, so here it is offered to us. And it's very exciting to be in this field of human endeavor where we're making such tremendous progress, especially in the last like 10 years or so, just a huge uh, understanding and progress forward. So it is a very exciting field to be in. So getting back to the fungus and bacteria ratio. Uh, so uh, basically, if you take a soil, well, let's talk about them in a natural soil first. Uh, the fungal organisms, of course, are basically like a network that runs, could be uh, interconnected basically over the entire continent uh, because the, the fungus are the freeway or the veins of the soil. Uh, 
and they provide for an interconnectedness where nutrients and materials and water and information can move down this highway. So uh, it is, yeah, let's call it the nervous system of the soil. So it's very responsive and it can uh, signal to one plant to another through the fungal networks of the soil. So for instance, in a forest, uh, you have plants that will leaf out earlier in the season and you have plants that leaf, the taller ones usually leaf out later in the season. So the first thing in the spring, uh, the, the, sub, the, sub the lower canopy plants all leaf out. Well, they're connected to the larger plants. They already started their photosynthesis and through the fungal networks, they start providing food, information, uh, whatever necessary. They're already activated plants leafing out in the spring, giving the uh, larger plants uh, some of that uh, boost of new life. And then the larger plants come on and then they blot out the sun, well, at least they used to, uh, for the lower canopy plants. However, the lower canopy plants are still connected to the upper canopy and the upper canopy plants can obviously keep those lower plants alive during the, the period where there's less sunlight to the plants. So uh, down below, there's nature is in constant uh, symbiotic relationship with each other. That's just a very simple example, but it is everywhere going on like that. Nature is sharing everywhere. Uh, sharing is the order of nature. Competition is not the, the, the order of nature, nature thrives from uh, interconnectedness and a sharing based uh, uh, effort. And uh, you know, with a little, little aggression mixed in there. So uh, on, our, on our farms, that's what we want to be also uh, emulating. Now, the earth is also sentient. Okay, that this is really is the, a, a nervous system. It is not just nutrients that pass over those fungal networks. Information passes over the fungal networks as well. Uh, so plants signal each other. They tell each other things through uh, various this information highway, uh, much better than the internet. Uh, sending all that information all around natural systems. Nature monitors us. Nature is in contact with all the living organisms that is on the surface of the earth. Uh, animals, plants, much more adapted and tuned in to the natural systems. Humans, we have separated ourselves, uh, and which has given us incredible abilities on the one side. However, uh, to fully function, we need to reestablish our deep level connections with natural uh, systems. So be assured that at all times, nature is listening to you, watching you, observing you, feeling what you are doing in your field. So all actions are important. Everything is interconnected. Uh, so it is all things are take into account when you are working with soil quality. So getting back to the fungal network, they are reaching out into the greater soil, bringing back liquid nutrients, uh, mineral compounds, and they are able to move those over quite a distance and move them into the rhizosphere. Sometimes the fungal roots and the roots of the plants bond directly. Sometimes they're just alongside and they have this gelatinous substance between them, but there's an active interchange. Uh, the bacteria are much more, uh, isolated. They don't reach out through the soil to that level of a degree, but they are very good at decomposing things very quickly and getting a nutrient release to the plant. So to have both in place is very useful. Tillage equipment severely damages fungal networks and dramatically increases bacterial activity in the soil, much to the detriment, again, of your fungal uh, uh, organisms. So in just let's take a, a basic uh, plow or rototiller example, come through the soil, churn all that material, kill all those earthworms, chew up all those fungal networks and work a bunch of compost and uh, fragments of plant residue into the soil surface. What happens? Massive explosion of bacteria, 
decomposing everything as fast as possible, uh, huge boom in uh, gaseous releases in the soil, disturbing the soil further with a high level of that kind of activity. Uh, the nutrient release is massive. There's tremendous uh, uh, potential for leaching of those nutrients through the soil because they're all released at the same time, and you put a little seedling into it. The little seedling doesn't need all that ridiculous nutrition you just created through that tillage event and uh, is overgrown fat and lazy as a young plant. Then when the plant finally gets to a size where it really needs a lot of nutrients, all that stuff has been burned out, uh, eaten up, decomposed, and moved on, and now you have a serious period where the plant needs piles of nutrition, but the bacteria have collapsed and there's no fungal network in place to provide the, the nutrition that is necessary to provide for that plant. And so that is an extremely common cycle in vegetable production with tillage events and fertilizer uh, application. Way overfed uh, young plants, not enough nutrition when the plant most needs it, say at tomato fruiting. After the plant's been in the ground for three months, that is all long gone, uh, needs uh, rate when it needs its most interconnected, uh, fungal oriented nutrient release nothing in place. The bacteria are extremely good at releasing very soluble, easy elements like nitrogen and potassium. The fungus are much better at getting you really high quality materials like those trace elements I was discussing, along with your calcium, your magnesium, and your phosphorus. So uh, a bacteria oriented uh, soil which went through a tillage event, is going to grow a lush plant really quick that's really weak, prone to insects and disease attack. A very balanced fungal to uh, bacteria ratio is going to give you uh, a slower growth, actually. Not real slow, but it's not going to be what was termed lush and weak. It's going to grow. It's going to grow steady. It's going to have uh, rigidity and fle flexibility that's appropriate for its survival. And uh, however, when it comes time for big needs for nutrient, uh, like when it's fruiting and ripening fruit, you're going to have the necessary quality elements and molecules ready to get into that plant to keep the quality high instead of it succumbing to the insects and disease rate. So your fungal to bacteria ratio is very important to keep in mind so now let's start talking about the benefits of tillage. So what we have here is the plow. And basically when we start a new field out of sod, we plow it. And we go through a whole tillage event. Often that is the only tillage event that will occur. Sometimes we'll repeat a tillage event in the second year in order to make sure that it's all set to go into a no-till system where hopefully it will remain uh, permanently unless something happens that requires tillage again in the future. But essentially that's what we're aiming for. So we use tillage tools to invert the sod and turn nature from a perennial culture of perennial plants into an area that is appropriate for annual vegetation to be grown in. Annual vegetables are, basically the earth is covered in perennials and the, the place of annuals is for a disturbed ecosystem. When something happens in the environment, nature responds with very fast growing plants that can quickly cover the soil surface. Those are annuals. Uh, after a fire, after other damage, uprooted trees in a forest or something like that. Nature constantly wants to be completely covered in growing vegetation. Another uh, basic principle to keep in mind. Uh, and that's what we seek, is to have the soil covered at all times with uh, growing vegetation. If we can't cover it with growing vegetation, we'll cover it with organic matter. But you have two primary means to feed the soil biology and that is through active plants photosynthesizing and pumping sugars down into the soil microbiology, or you can be, they can be fed through 
uh, the decomposition of organic matter as uh, the decay of the once living things, are, the nutrients from that and the energy from its uh, uh, decomposition are brought into the soil. Those are the two main mechanisms to keep the soil life functioning in terms of uh, your management. Uh, and you should seek, or it's very useful to do both of those things all the time. So getting back to tillage, so here we are flipping over the sod. It is obviously creating a plow pan below where the, the plow is being forced down onto that soil down below. And uh, so we're going to have to address that. Usually, well, any field that we have ever gone onto, uh, which is three different ones presently, uh, has always had a compacted layer anyway that all the fields, they, because they were hayed, they had hay equipment on them at all different times, they always have a plow pan already in place. So it's not like we were just creating one, it was already there anyway. So, however, in this case, uh, in order to move a field relatively quickly into an annual production system, we choose tillage. There are other options. That's a two bottom moldboard plow uh, behind the super C. So it's a plow, it's inverting soil. Those are trash boards on the surface. Just sometimes uh, it'll help throw the soil over. You know, plowing is a bit of an art. I'm not a great plow expert or anything, but you want a nice uh, furrow that flips over fully so that the sod is completely uh, inverted, which of course is terrible on the soil market biology, totally inverted the soil profile. Uh, however, it's uh, a quick and easy way to turn a perennial uh, culture into an annual culture. Relatively gentle compared to, say, a rototiller or something like that. It's just a flip over. Uh, but that's, yeah, the, this is all, I'm going to show you just traditional uh, approach. So that's plow. We plowed with the moldboard plow. Now we are harrowing. When you, when you moldboard plow, the furrows are all, uh, here, I'll go back. A somewhat irregular, uh, there's a lot of bumps, air in and around the, the, the thrown over furrow slices. So you're going to want to immediately uh, smooth those down, crush them down. So basically, you know, the old saying is plow in the morning only as much as you can harrow in the afternoon. So it's basically a plow harrow immediate sequence. Because if you leave the plowed ground open uh, and unharrowed, uh, a lot more damage can happen to the soil microbiology just because of how much air is exposing, you know, it's up, uh, raised areas. And so you, you get a lot more exposure to harsh elements than if you crush it back down with the disc harrow immediately after plowing. So basically plow harrow sequence uh, in the same day. Then, now once that has happened, we chisel plow the uh, bed. But let me talk about this first before I talk about the chisel plow, because actually what we do do, uh, these are a little out of sequence, is the plowed ground is more or less immediately shaped into its bedding system. So in this case, the, the Super C tractor has got two disc harrows or disc uh, hillers mounted on its uh, mid, mid belly frame uh, cultivation rig. That is, so the harrows are throwing the soil up after the front tire, before the rear tire, tire and the roller is recondensing the uh, soil that has been thrown up plus recondensing the plowed and harrowed ground. So the roller is extremely useful for knocking back the excessive irritation, irritation uh, intervention and aeration of uh, a plow or rototiller event. So this is bed shaping. And so we plow harrow in bed shape essentially right away. It could all happen in the same day. The, now what we've established, as I discussed with you before, is a wheel track, which is our walkway, and a bed. 
uh, in this field and in uh, one of the other ones, what we do is it's a 58 inch bed with a 10 inch uh, wheel track walkway, which converts to a 68 inch bed center to center, which allows us to convert in and out of 34 inch row cropping. So we can switch the bedding system in and out of 34 inch potato rows or into 58 inch beds with a 10 inch wheel track. And so that is all, you know, very specifically designed. You know, the bedding system needs to be consistent and it, all the equipment fits on this bedding system. The home field uh, where we do all the winter vegetable production with the low tunnels, I'll show you as a different bedding system. It's a 36 inch bed with an eight inch wheel track, but we're gonna talk about this one for now. Uh, so, cause this is where we do row cropping or bedding. Uh, all the tractors and equipment and, uh, you know, whether it's the harrow fits that bed, whether it's the field cultivator, it fits that bed, the roller fits that bed, the manure spreader fits this bed, the pickup truck fits the bed. So uh, everything is designed so that the bedding system is consistent and can fit all the appropriate equipment over the field because we will never, now that we have driven or plowed this field with what is considered broad acreage tillage. In other words, we plowed the whole thing. It will never be plowed again like that. If we have to till the surface of a bed due to a perennial weed or something uh, uh, inappropriate happening, if it, will, it will be only the bed surface that will be tilled at this point. Because once we have bed shaped like this, those wheel tracks are permanent. And one of our first moves from coming out of a tillage system and going into a no-till system, which took many years of slow conversion. So, uh, but one of the first, first it was experimentation to make sure it would work. And then there was a slow conversion period as we reduced tillage until we finally, after several years of experimentation and development, went into a fully no-till system. But I'm gonna show you how you could just enter, because now we just enter directly into a no-till system if we start a new field. But uh, the permanent wheel track, is the, the, was the start of our reduced tillage. Because once we switch to a permanent wheel track, uh, then only the bed surfaces would be being uh, disturbed with tillage equipment. And uh, that allowed for con only compaction happening, whether it's the track, truck, tractor, foot traffic, only happens in that wheel track. So there was never a need to re-till a soil due to uh, compaction issues with machineries or humans. So uh, the permanent wheel track or you know, foot, foot traffic area is, uh, was you know, one of the first steps and critical move towards uh, a no-till system. So you know, very simple. And most of the stuff I'm gonna show you here is very low cost equipment. There's nothing fancy. That's, a lot of it's just traditional uh, equipment. The tractors are all really old, but they're very useful. Uh, and I should talk about that quickly, is that, you know, we have a lot of equipment. It's all pretty simple stuff. Uh, we have found that uh, with small-scale vegetable production, it really only requires minimal uh, mechanical equipment. Uh, and that human labor is really the most important thing. Humans always do everything better. Uh, this roller works on this field, but if, if we had enough humans with hand tools, they could compact that soil much more delicately and carefully than driving this tractor with this giant roller over. You know, machinery is just about making go faster, generally not better. So uh, the management and handling of your labor and how you work and work with people is really important. And I'm gonna talk about that on Sunday. I'm gonna do more uh, labor and marketing. I have a one and a half hour in the morning. I'm not gonna get into marketing today or working with people. Uh, this is all just gonna be practical on uh, tillage equipment, or, uh, uh, field preparation and growing conditions. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that more on uh, Sunday morning. But uh, so low level investment though in equipment, and that's what makes this kind of thing really popular is, you know, we're not a dairy farm with a thousand cows that has massive infrastructure, massive investment needs. 
we are a small scale farm that needs very little levels of equipment and uh, necessary uh, infrastructure. Not that you shouldn't have it and have nice equipment when you need it, but in general, uh, these tractors are very affordable. These Super C's were a great uh, uh, vegetable tractor. It, the, the tract is from like 1952. This one might be, a, yeah, there's a 52 or a 51. Uh, these machines will never die. They will just keep going. They have nothing, there's no reason anything will ever stop them. It's probably why they went out of business is because they made millions of these and they're still all around. Uh, but uh, uh, they don't make machines like this anymore. They, uh, to a large degree. This is made to drive over field crops with, let me see one more picture of it. Yeah, you see, uh, wide open belly mounts all kinds of implements very much designed they, they call it they don't call it a farm all for no reason it can do everything you know drive over crops uh, plow harrow uh, and so cultivate crops you know provide you the power for the manure spreaders the potato diggers what you know very very versatile machines it costs like two thousand dollars they're everywhere you know because nobody does this kind of thing and uh very affordable. So we have two of those. Uh, and then we have two smaller cub tractors, which are the tractor for the smaller bedding system, uh, which are basically littler tractors with offset, uh, the, the seat and uh, engine are offset to one side. So you are looking right down the center of the row, right in front of you, very low to the ground. So you can cultivate your single row. This is essentially considered a two row tractor because it, it would go out over two 34-inch rows or 36-inch rows or whatever. Obviously, they're adjustable axles. Uh, so uh, the two-row tractor gives us more power to pull larger implements, like the cub cannot run a potato digger or a manure spreader. However, the little tractors have much more cultivation uh, finesse than uh, a larger tractor. Not that this isn't sufficient. You can just do one row at a time by just setting up your one row over on this side instead of setting both at the same time. Cultivating two rows at a time is much more difficult than cultivating one row at a time. So, uh, but they do provide you a little more horsepower. Obviously they give a little more compaction and things like that. All very affordable machines. And then the other machine that is probably the most important tractor, which I'll show you later, is uh, the loader tractor. Uh, the loader, which these machines are not particularly good at because they're built high so that you can drive over crops, which a loader makes it unstable to have a tractor uh, on a high tractor. So they're built squat and not really meant to drive over crops. So, and then the loader tractor. So, uh, you know, if you had to have just one machine, going with the loader tractor would make the most sense because it, the, the main job is all that compost and mulch and things I'm gonna be talking about. To lift those things with your back when it's tons and tons of material is very difficult. But if you, the, the simple action of a loader lifting tons, of, well, it ends up being tons, but lifting that material and then dumping it down into carts, wheelbarrows, manure spreader, whatever it is, we never lift, we, we apply probably 100 tons of materials to these fields a year. We never lift any of it with our backs. It's always just putting it down and then raking it out because the loader has lifted it into the air and put it into something that then will allow it to be distributed. So we never lift uh, all the tons of materials. So if there's one machine to get, it probably is the loader tractor. Uh, and these ones are more accessory because you could do this all by hand, more or less, or with a little machine like a little BCS or something like that. But uh, certainly, if you can afford, they're not very expensive and there's a lot of them around. So again, this is just bed shaping and you can see that it is creating a raised bed surface. So the raised bed obviously is very useful for drainage to some degree. Uh, if you're in a dry environment, you would not want to raise your beds. If you are in a wet environment that needs drainage, uh, raised beds are very useful for getting excessive moisture out of the way uh, and providing you know, an obvious placement of the bed in the field so you will see the wheel track in the future to be able to uh, continue to work with that wheel track. Very, once we're in a no-till system, very occasionally, like maybe every four or five years, we will come through and reshape the bed, right? Because the wheel track eventually fills in and then you can't see really where to bed, you know. You know. So, you know, every few years we'll come through kind of depending on where it is uh, and just throw the soil back up on the bedding surface 
uh, through a procedure like this, obviously without the plow and all that kind of thing. So let's go back now. So I'm getting through the sequence of plow harrow bed shape. Then once the beds are shaped, we pull a chisel plow through to break up the plow pan that, we, that is in place through the tillage event. And a chisel plow, and I don't have another picture of it, but essentially it's just a giant shank with a point on it that goes ripping through uh, down to like 16, 18 inches. Uh, in this case, uh, simply we just bought the actual chisel plow tine itself and bolted it onto the, to the cultivation rig of the rear of the tractor, which is uh, I think an inch and a half drawbar. So we did not need to buy a separate chisel plow implement because there's whole implements, you know, they're you know, mounted on a three point hitch or something like that. And it was much more affordable just to buy a couple of the shanks and arms and uh, uh, just mount it right on the uh, drawbar. So that rips through the soil. And in the second year of this field, we did come back through the second year and run a chisel plow back through it again at a different setting, you know, not in the same exact slot that it was in uh, the previous year. And that kind of helped to just break that plow pan up fully. And then once that's done, we will never create that plow pan again. So it's uh, ready to go. And, uh, uh, you know, as I said, we might bed shape again. So now basically the objective of all this is to eliminate uh, perennial weeds in the field and turn it into a clean annual field. So the tillage needs to be thorough, needs to be well done, needs to be carefully done but it needs to be effective because what I'm gonna get into with no-till, no-till with the system, basically any no-till system is not tolerant of perennial weeds. Uh, and perennial weeds are particularly susceptible to tillage events. So you want the, the, the perennials to be completely eradicated through the tillage event. And so that is done by doing everything I just showed you, chisel plowing, uh, being the last move, and then allowing that soil to d uh, dry out or die, whatever uh, vegetation, say it's got quack grass in it. Let's give, let's give a quack grass example, common weed in a, in a hay lot that would be a problem in a vegetable patch. So say you've got quack grass, white rhizome runners, you know, uh, difficult to eradicate, uh, sometimes. So you want to completely deal with quack grass. If the field had quack grass in it, I would have chisel plowed. You know, those first events definitely chopped up the quack and started its decline. Although it's chopped up now, it's going to try to sprout from a lot of different areas. So the, the initial plowing and harrowing started the decomposition or the destruction of the quack. However, uh, and now we leave the soil surface exposed through the sun and wind and any uh, rhizomes that are on the surface will effectively die. We will come back in a couple weeks with a light tillage tool, namely uh, a field cultivator. At that point, you could certainly use a rototiller at that point. Uh, these fields were prepared without the rototiller. So a field cultivator, uh, well actually, I didn't even use the field cultivator. A field cultivator is very similar to cultivation equipment that's on the belly of the tractor. Just a bunch of tines, shallow tines, like small chisel plows that go through the soil and they pull up the quack grass roots and gang them and leave them on the soil surface. You could also rototiller. The rototiller will wind up the quack grass roots and leave them on the surface of the soil. So uh, a gentle pass with a shallow tillage implement. Wait two weeks in the sun, in the summertime or spring, and come back with another pass of the field cultivator or uh, rototiller. Usually that is all it will take to eliminate all the perennial weeds in a field. If there's something particularly tenacious, maybe another 
pass, but essentially a waiting period of a couple weeks between passes of the light tillage tools, gentler the better, allows for a full uh, destruction of the perennial culture that is in place. If, if this field was actually prepared in the more towards the fall, I believe, this was pretty late in the season. So in this case, what we did is we uh, plowed and harrowed and, and uh, bed shaped. And then I believe we cover cropped the field through the winter. And so that's why, let's go back here. Yeah, cover cropped through the winter. And that's why you see rye and such in this field where we're, we're chisel plowing here. So there was actually a break. We, we plowed, harrowed, bed shaped in the fall and seeded uh, a cover crop onto the field and then came back in the spring with the chisel plows and the light tillage passes to eliminate fully the uh, perennial weeds that were in place. So, but it could all certainly be done in the spring, but this allowed us a better jump on getting it going a little bit earlier in the season. Okay, so now this is a potato digger. Uh, I do like this potato digger. It was very affordable. It's $400. Generally, we don't use it because they completely trash the soil. They just, all the soil moves up on that conveyor belt, uh, is churned about, the potatoes rattle along the top and then are deposited behind the potato digger. Uh, somewhat dangerous to extremely dangerous. It, it is, uh, you know, the PTO is spinning. PTO is grind up humans uh, with, with no guards really in place. Uh, and apparently they, you see that that's a seat on top of above the spreader where apparently you're supposed to put your child or something to, in order for them to, to, to stomp the spuds and sod while the chain is churning below them and the, the PTO is spinning at ridiculously rapid rates right next to them. So anyway, we barely used that machine. We used it this year because the potatoes, uh, a bunch of them had difficulties and it was so wet uh, that we decided we're, instead of having the crew get out there and dig rotten potatoes in a mucky soil, which would, is close to torture, uh, we, we put the machine in the field and dealt with the damage of running a potato digger through the field instead of completely demoralizing human beings. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some other options. So I went through tillage and how to achieve uh, the initial uh, field preparation, but now I'm gonna talk about not doing that. So here is your basic other option. Well, at least probably the most prominent other option is simply a long-term coverage under a black plastic tarp. And the black plastic tarp uh, basically eliminates light. It also heats to some degree. Uh, but it eliminates uh, light and causes, uh, basically, it can kill perennials uh, effectively. Mostly, by the way, it starves them of light. The heat is not super uh, conducive to uh, being able to kill perennials. Very effective at killing annuals. But, uh, so blotting out the light. And this is a, a silage tarp, you know, big and heavy and stretched across this area. This area was actually, this is actually covered in the winter, not for to convert it out of sod, but it had come up with a, a, a Canada thistle, thistle infestation that uh, was very detrimental uh, to this area. And we found, well, my father-in-law first experimented with this, but you could lay down black plastic tarps in the fall and the Canada thistle, which is a serious, fierce weed, uh, very, very deep rooted and difficult to eradicate. Uh, the can of thistle being cold tolerant and generally grows in the colder period, uh, could not tolerate being covered through till uh, about mid late May. So we could cover this after crop production, say this is probably like November or something, October, November, and then take the cover off by mid May and still get uh, a reasonable crop production and eradicate our fierce perennial weed that was in place in that area. However, this could certainly be used over sod as well. Uh, we do like to have a few holes in it that allow moisture to move in so that it's not completely drying out the soil. And hopefully the soil is, is enough 
uh, structured that it can move that moisture out and keep itself hydrated. So by keeping the soil hydrated and keeping it covered, you know, obviously the earth would be better off if it was under an organic cover with a cover crop that was effective at smothering the sod. But, you know, this is uh, an alternative to uh, the tillage event that puts you in place. Now, I would remind you, however, that uh, there, this does not deal with the plow pan that is likely in place over almost all sod land I have ever seen in this region. So you can deal with the plow pan without tillage as well, using deep-rooted perennial or deep-rooted uh, cover crops uh, to kind of poke holes through it. And obviously, over time, bringing up the biological nature of the soil, the earthworms they will they will they will puncture through that soil uh, layer eventually. But in the short term, you know, it depends on how long you have what you're trying to achieve but uh, certainly coming through with a chisel plow addresses it in a much quicker manner. Did you have a question? Okay. So uh, there's the black plastic uh, solarization event. Uh, another option is to smother the surface with organic matter. This is straw. This is actually just over uh, an area that is going to be an early spring vegetables that we did not want to cover crop this fall. So, uh, but this would be also be effective at eliminating a perennial culture if it's thick enough, which is kind of erratic. So, uh, depends on how fierce the perennials are that is underneath the organic layer. This obviously has the benefit uh, over to black plastic of allowing for air and water and active decomposition going on of this material as it sits there, uh, but does not offer the absolute success of blotting out all the perennials. So uh, to make this more effective, you can certainly place cardboard underneath it. And the cardboard uh, is quite effective at eliminating the ability of perennials to come up through it. So cardboard and then wood chip or straw on top of the leaf, on top of the, any of those materials, organic materials. Uh, and another option is hot hay. So fresh cut hay uh, piled to a pretty thick layer uh, heats. You know, fresh grass, grass clippings would do the same thing. And that the mulching and blotting out of the sun can burn out a perennial uh, that is below it. So I've never used the heating method with hay on sod, but we have uh, demonstrated that in a field with winter squash where there was quack grass, where we simply piled fresh, we just sickle barred down a bunch of hay, piled it up really thick, a couple feet maybe, foot and a half, uh, and the heating of fresh grasses was able to burn out the quack grass infestation between the uh, winter squash rows as well as spurning on some uh, uh, microbes and nutrient, which was a benefit too. So those are some of your basic options. So with the straw in the question, you put that on in the fall, and then if you're doing the tillage, you would put it on in the fall? A sod under straw? You're asking? Uh, you're trying to get rid of a sod under straw? Well, in that, yeah. that example there, this example is not sod, as I said. This is uh, just vegetable. There's some chickweed and some vegetable residue under there that will be decomposed uh, by spring when we take this off. So this is just going to be raked aside, okay. seeded, and then actually put back on. So we're not going to rake the whole thing off at once. We'll rake a couple beds to the side, seed or transplant, move the mulch back onto those beds, and work down so we're not removing everything because eventually it's going to go back on there anyway. And so it just kind of moves to the side and it moves forward. Uh, yeah, and so say you had chickweed on the ground right now and you covered it with straw, it might not die because now it's so cold, everything's so dormant that it's going to take even longer for that chickweed to die. You, if you covered right now, if you went out and cut, covered it, uh, it would still be alive probably well into April, maybe into May as a guess, as opposed to this, which got covered probably in October. 
And so in that it was still warm enough and it's gonna be long enough that the, the chickweed is decayed, you know, because of this, everything's still active. It wasn't into a frozen state yet. So if you're using a heavy mulch, you know, you gotta kinda figure out when, how long it's gonna take. Uh, a common routine for this kind of thing would be uh, in the first year to just not even do anything but leave it in place and transplant a tomato crop through it or a transplanted crop. So you just made little holes and put it in so you don't even ever pull it off. It just stays in place and keeps going. So that'd be one option, you know. And it's all just about getting started too. A lot of times the first year isn't gonna be great, even with a tillage event, might be, might not be, kind of depends on the soil qualities and different things. But uh, once you get the biology up and functioning, uh, you should be off and running pretty quickly. Uh, just a quick third option is that we have uh, used sawdust and wood chip to burn out perennial weeds by applying a nitrogen source to the high carbon material in order to create basically an infield composting uh, reaction so that the, you know, this is burning out quack grass along the edge of the field there with a heated wood chip material. So that's certainly another option to, you know, if you have the tillage equipment, uh, we, we, we definitely like an initial tillage to the field. But, you know, there's certainly other people and other ways of doing things. Nothing I say here is, you know, uh, meant to be what you should do. You know, I'm just trying to give you ideas. Every production system is completely different. And although I have certainly see, seen what I'm going to discuss all here, work very effectively in other environments and on other farms. You know, every farm is different, the variables are different, and so my objective is to simply provide you with enough information, ideas, and concepts so that you can take and apply them to your farm at the right time, in the right moment, and under the right conditions. Right, so a question? A question back to your, um, okay. Your heat, you said heated sawdust? Yeah, but, heated, oh, yeah. no, by applying nitrogen, to the high carbon material, uh, it starts to compost. Yeah, and so the heat of composting, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah burns it out, yep. Which probably over a large area, you know, because I've thought about doing it on a larger scale too. Edges, edges. Yeah, uh, but. Sawdust, exactly, crack would not be stopped by sawdust if you didn't heat it, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but if you were gonna do that on a large scale, uh, Chopped grass is, at least in our region, uh, highly available from uh, the large dairy farms that are just going through with flail choppers and chopping hay and blowing it into those giant trucks. And you could get a delivery of a giant pile of chopped hay, very affordable, that would be a very high heating, uh, effective material to mulch with on a, on a much larger scale. But for small scale, you know, you can just use home equipment or whatever, or do, you know, those other ideas. But uh, so now let's get into some of the specifics of no-till. So basically with the no-till system that I'm going to talk about here, the, the one machine that we use a lot of is a BCS mowing machine. And a BCS is simply a two-wheel tractor, very small piece of equipment. And we have a, a number of different mowing attachments that fit on it. This, we recently purchased a flail mower that fits on the front of it, uh, which is extremely effective, and I really like it. It was a little expensive. It was like two or $3,000 for a mowing implement, but I really like it, and that was worth the investment. Previously, we were using a rotary mower, which is essentially, that's up on the left there, a two giant, uh, well, two, it's like a giant lawn mower, essentially, very, very heavy duty but looks a lot like two giant lawnmower blades spinning around. Uh, rotary mower, you know, mowing this way. Also very effective. We use that for a, probably a decade of no-till. And then we have a sickle bar mower off to the right there that uh, can undercut and lay down materials if we want to leave them in a larger, longer state than chopped up by the other mowing equipment. So the mowing equipment is... Uh, generally front mounted. Yep, there it is front mounted. That's the rotary mower front mounted on that. And which allows you to mow in front of you. Whereas my tractor mowers are generally mounted to the side or behind us. And I generally 
really appreciate the maneuverability of a smaller, lighter machine with a front-mounted implement than a tractor-mounted mowing machine. It allows much more finesse, intricacy, better mowing. And so generally we use the BCS for all our mowing events, unless it's so small of an area to mow that we get in with a hand tool. And then we would come in with a scythe or a machete, and we have numerous takes on all these things. We have sickles and scythes of all nature. We have machetes that look like hatchets. Uh, they're long, short, you know, we have tremendous volumes of hand tools. Uh, the hand tools, basically I always try to have the hand tools available to achieve whatever needs to happen and then build machinery on top of that so that when the machinery fails, we can immediately revert to a hand tool because so often timing is so critical on something. And so there's always a backup to everything. There's always, there's two tractors, there's two cubs, there's two, uh, well, my neighbor has the other loader, but there's two loader tractors, there's two super C's, there's two water pumps, there's two chainsaws. There's the hand tools, there's the machinery tools. Everything is like backed up with other uh, uh, ways of achieving the same objective. And generally, I always want the human uh, uh, effort to be uh, well prepared. So I have enough machetes, I have enough shovels, I have enough whatever it is to uh, get the job done with humans. So, because humans always do it better. You know, granted, it might be hard work, they might not go as fast, and uh, you know, might not be as profitable, but it can always be done with the human. So, uh, yeah, machetes, you know, great. Putting a human with a, a sigh going down the field, it, it saves on squishing the soil with the little BCS, even though, you know, it doesn't squish the soil too much, but it's just better, you know? Uh, you know, it requires more finesse, more effort, but and so generally we'll use the machinery, but you know, they're in place and ready to go. Okay, so some other tools that we also utilize when we're not able to mow are the uh, wide grub hose and the very wide half moon hoe off to the side there. And this is a, is a tined uh, hoe that we use to loosen the surface of the soil if we're seeding. And the reason that we have to use those for soil prep sometimes is because, as you're gonna see in a minute, the field, the no-till system is reliant on the sun to effectively solarize the previous crop that was in place. If we cannot solarize a crop, we will mow it and then chop off whatever root residue is left of the previous vegetable crop with one of those wide hoes. We will use the, primarily the half moon because it just undercuts the soil very cleanly uh, with less disturbance if it's a heavy rooted vegetable residue that needs uh, more th thorough treatment we come in with the, the, the heavier grub hoe on the left there if the soil if we're not going to recompost on the soil or somehow it's been walked upon or something too much we will loosen the very surface of the soil with that those tines there simply by running them over the bed surface very quickly so those we'll kind of talk about more late, later, but I just wanted you to see what uh, so many alternatives to solarization are there. However, this is the mowing machine in action. So here was a lettuce planting that is between the uh, a couple uh, rows of tomatoes. It was a salad green lettuce that was chopped a couple times probably, and then uh, the tomatoes, you know, getting up taller, they need more room. Uh, the salad greens, that already, the lettuces that already been harvested, they're mown off. The tomatoes are now gonna grow in over that area. Uh, so these are 36 inch beds. I just mowed a 36 inch bed in, down the middle. Those tomatoes are each on a 36 inch bed, eight inch wheel track in between. So that's the spacing. This shows the intensive nature of the production. In other words, uh, I could have just planted the tomatoes and put nothing in the middle there. Uh, and just waited for the tomatoes to fill out. But everything is so intensive on the farm operation that that soil, I want it A, covered, 
uh, be covered with a growing plant, namely a lettuce crop, to keep the soil biology in place. And I wanted to market additional vegetables through growing more food in a, in a given area. So it achieves all of those things, the intensive nature of the production. And now I just mowed that off and the tomatoes are gonna fill that area in, still leaving us enough room to harvest in between. So in its simple, simplest of form, that was simply mowed down in a bunch of straw and hay thrown on top of the lettuce root residues. The lettuce roots are very weak and they're not gonna come up through a mulch of uh, hay and straw. So they, they will simply rot under that hay and straw while the tomatoes fill in. We will harvest the tomatoes, uh, frost will come in, uh, the tomatoes will die, we'll yank the tomatoes out and there's nothing to stop us from simply just going back in and reseeding. Uh, tomatoes are, we do a minor amount of pruning of tomatoes. Those are obviously indeterminate tomatoes that have uh, very large growth. And so all the suckers are removed up to the first flower where the first uh, main shoot comes off right below the first flower. So they're suckered up to that and then allowed to just grow. And so, let's see, this is pretty old pictures, but yeah, you can still see here. Uh, I can't. So basically, with such large tomato plants, and not to condense them too much, uh, we run three rows of tomato stakes for a given row. So the, the center stake is the tomato is staked right to that center stake, and the plant is tied onto that stake. The, down the sides, uh, we generally run strings, and so it's basically the tomatoes are boxed in to a large box. The tomato stakes on the outside are often tilted out to give the canopy enough air and sunlight to allow the plant to get to as large a size as possible, to give us uh, as large a yield as possible. And they are, uh, you know, they're boxed in, and sometimes the, the limbs are also tied onto either the twine that's run down those rows or to the actual tomato stakes that are uh, on the outer rows as well. So they're very large plants. Obviously, if we're growing smaller plants, the trellising is different, but this, we grow a lot of indeterminate. We save a lot of our own seeds of a very large variety. Uh, so generally, the tomato patch looks a lot like this. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'm going to show you more of that. There'll be piles of examples of, of the diversity of the planting. Uh, and so it, it, it is not only diverse in how much of it gets converted in an area, but how quickly it gets converted. So generally, if it goes from vegetation uh, to a next crop, often that happens within 24 hours. So the soil biology is never left just in a lurch with no vegetation growing there. I mean, sometimes, you know, we'll mow off a field, solarize it, and we can be transplanting new plants into it by that evening. So it can be very, very quick turnover, but I'll show you lots of examples of how we handle that. This obviously is gonna be allowed to sit simply for space issues of the tomatoes are gonna to get so big and Yep. Sometimes we do do things like that, uh, certainly. It would have to be, in this case, an annual. And uh, because perennials don't, we can't, when we're selecting cover crops, we can't uh, introduce uh, a perennial into the system. And certainly we do incorporate cover crops into the system. However, uh, this, these tomatoes are so big, and you see how big those things are? Uh, uh, they're going to be overshadowing that really quick. So there's, it would be a very minimal establishment of a cover crop at that point if we tried to come in at that late. I'll show you pictures later where that kind of thing does go on. But uh, those are three foot beds, yep. Well, with an eight inch wheel track between them. Yep, 36 inches down the middle there. So <clears throat> this, and this is an example 
of garlic harvest. And the, uh, the garlic has just been pulled out of these beds in the, in the forefront, which is showing the level of weed control. You know, one of the primary reasons for having to till the soil is to deal with the weeds that are in place. <clears throat> if there are no weeds in place, uh, you start to begin to not have to till for that reason. So that it can be very, very useful, both in terms of reducing your tillage uh, and improving your profitability, because one of the main things that is a labor intensive and very expensive is to employ labor to deal with weeds in your crop production system. So if you eliminate the weeds uh, is a very uh, good direction for profitability. You have a question? Are you sourcing weed-free mulch? Yeah, we are sourcing weed-free mulch to a large degree. And so I will discuss that coming up very soon in the mulch segment. Uh, so this is straw, and uh, but they're simply, so the garlic's pulled out, as I was just saying, in terms of speed, the garlic's pulled out, that bed simply gets raked off and seed tossed on it or a transplant put on it. It's, it's immediate, the transition from one into another. And that is again, intentional, so that we are constantly feeding the soil life with living plants in place as well as for profitability, where we are maximizing production on a given piece of land. So it is a very, very fast turnover. And when it, nothing stops that turnover. It doesn't matter how wet that soil is. If that soil was wet, you couldn't till it. If it was full of weeds and wet, like this year, how could you ever till that soil to prepare it for its next crop? There's no waiting for uh, you know, the proper conditions for tillage. There's no waiting for the decomposition from a tillage event to subside. It's, so it's a very, very quick, quick turnover of one crop into another. Uh, another example of uh, not having to till is this was a callaloo crop, uh, basically a glorified amaranth that is sold as a leafy green. And we simply mowed it off and it's frost insensitive. So we mowed it off in the fall. We're not even going to solarize or do anything else. We can just seed right into this. Uh, residue and all, sometimes we'll just throw seeds right into the residue because there are no weeds. And I mean, obviously sometimes we'll get weeds and stuff and I'll show you that, but in general, by and large, I mean, when you get into a weed-free production system, which this is all leading to, uh, everything goes faster, more efficient, more profitable. Uh, weeds, as much as you know, they're beneficial because they are nature's way of covering the soil and great indicators to you of what you are doing, what weeds are there, indicates what conditions you have set up in your field condition. Uh, uh, in the end, uh, you really want you know, plants that you want growing there in place. Obviously, vegetable farming is a huge interruption in natural cycles, and you know, we have to uh, be very uh, thankful for, for what nature is able to accommodate. We are imposing our will on nature. And so uh, to, to, uh, to have these approaches, uh, nature uh, is much more accommodating so the uh, frost is just going to kill this out. It's the same with those tomatoes that I was talking about earlier. We're just going to mow those tomatoes off. Uh, and then, you know, if there's no weeds, you know, simply start the new crop, the fall crop, right in without doing anything but putting the new plant in place. So with the, I have a question with the amaranth, what, what did you follow up with? Um, there is a crop rotation chart on there. It's incredibly diverse planting. So in that case, I can't remember, you know, there's so many crops and so long. Um, in the springtime, do you do any broad forking or anything like that? No, no broad forking. We have broad forked in the past, but uh, this field, uh, broad forking, certainly we've seen guys go through a field like an acre and broad fork an acre. It's, it's a labor intensive effort. Uh, uh, However, the chisel plow is basically the replacement of the broad fork. Uh, once these fields are chisel plowed or, or broad forked or something uh, and treated this way, they never seem to require additional uh, disturbance of the soil profile to that depth. You know, things could go wrong, maybe something happens, you have to get back in there, but in general, once you set the stage, 
uh, they shouldn't require that depth of tillage in the future. So this is what we do with primarily. So in the, particularly uh, in the spring, uh, summer, and early fall. And this is solarization. And this is what really led us to be able to do large scale no-till, was the ability to use uh, tarps in order to quickly solarize off the previous vegetation. Solarization like this, quick solarization under clear plastic, only works to kill annual weeds. It will certainly burn off the top of a clover or the top of a quack grass, but the perennial root is prepared to just send up a new shoot. So the, the solarization is to eliminate the annuals. So here's an example of a mown cover crop residue, I believe maybe it had a crop in it too. Uh, the sheet was put on, and this is probably a day later after a, a sunny day. And you know, the, the, all the annual vegetation is burned off except for maybe a few spots on the edges uh, where some air was, got entered into the system. In this case, we would simply take one of those grub hoes and chop off that little bit of green residue that's left there. Uh, in order to get to basically a brown mulch-like surface. So this is all the crop residue, simply ground down and then solarized. You use uh, clear plastic instead of black for that? Yeah. Would black prevent more light? The black does prevent more light. Uh, let's see. Okay, I don't have... Uh, but the, the clear heats faster. Yeah, so the clear is much faster than black. Uh, but as I said, the clear would not work for perennials, where the black, if you have a perennial problem, then the black plastic is the appropriate uh, tarp material. We want the tarps on the field and off the field as fast as possible to avoid soil damage. So tarping is not really beneficial in the sense of it's too hot for the soil microbiology. So ideally, I like to mow, put the cover on in the morning, and have it off in the evening. Often, it'll take you know, another day. Sometimes it'll take two days or even three days, depending on the vegetation and the sunlight and what's going on. You know, but you know, that's ideal. Often, we'll put it on in the morning. We'll remove it the next morning when we have you know, enough effort to be able to achieve those kinds of things, but generally 24 hours. What about perennials? The black plastic to solarize a perennial in uh, uh, like a heated condition, like spring or summer, not winter, because uh, they can go for a long time in winter. But uh, basically, most perennials will die in a four to six week period under black plastic. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the plastics are held down with sandbags. We keep the sandbags on the edge of the fields. The same plastics, oh, let me get you better examples. So here's an example of an enormous cover crop. Uh, this is like seven foot tall rye with uh, crimson clover all underneath it. And so it's absolutely massive, thick uh, cover crop in May. So oh, that's just the clover on the other side. of shows a little more clover than rye. So what we simply did here, well, somewhat simply, is we mowed off, say, a quarter acre of it. And then we have a quarter acre worth of tarps, clear plastic. We spread the clear plastic on a quarter acre, uh, left it for probably three days in the sun, because winter, uh, that level of vegetation, particularly the winter rye, uh, is more resistant to dying than a, like a lettuce crop or something. Uh, so it takes a little longer and it can be a little touchy in May because sometimes the temperatures aren't, that's a good picture, it's got the rye underneath the clover, you can see better. Uh, there's a lot of material there. It shows you know, the fertility of the field. Uh, it's very, very dense material. So, uh, it is variable, but this has been effective every year for, I don't know, eight years of doing this uh, with, in May like this with a massive cover crop in place. Again, the cover crop that is selected is always annuals. Uh, 
It's crimson clover, which is an annual clover, winter rye. Sometimes there's some vetch mixed in or some forage turnips or something, but all annuals because they're going to solarize <coughs> for us in the spring. So uh, you can see that now, and part of the reason it takes three days or even longer. Do you mow and then have to remove that? Yeah, that's what I'm getting to now. So uh, the, the residue is incredibly heavy, and that's kind of what protects the rye from solarization is because we just mowed off seven feet of rye and turned it into a straw that's on the surface of the soil, you know? And so that's like insulating and protecting those, the, the tops of those ryes we just mowed off. So of all our solarization events, solarizing this much rye is as hard as it gets. Uh, uh, this was actually rotary mode here. I would certainly use the, what's that? Right, right. The rotary mower does a pretty fair job of chopping it down. The easiest would be to sickle bar mow it and leave it in long strands, and then you know we could remove it and use it for other materials. But in this case, we are intentionally chopping it uh, with the uh, rotary or the flail mower in order to have us a chopped mulch that we're going to now use in the field in place. Uh, so. Uh, it's very thick and it's a great way to produce our own mulches for our own crops in the same field. So again, you can look at the efficiency of that. You can look at the profitability of saving on our mulch expenses and straw. It's weed free because of course we mow it before uh, they've gone into, especially the rye has gone into seed. I don't mind so much if the clover gets a few seeds and kind of, because not, a big competitor for the vegetable crops, and I can tolerate a little crimson clover here or there growing. Uh, but uh, yeah, we mow the rye at the perfect time, you know, massive vegetation, no seed heads, carbonaceous, and you know, not lush anymore, so it makes a great mulch material. And then, let's see, do I have pictures of raking it off? Okay. I don't have pictures of raking it off here, but this is, so this is that field. So here it is, solarization. You can see that there's also garlic and onions inter, you know, there's some strips of other stuff that went in earlier. But essentially, the, the quarter acre of plastics just goes chunk, chunk, right along the field. So we mow one section, one quarter acre, solarize it. While we've, then we mow the next quarter acre, move the sheets up the field and the bags and everything, and then immediately start uh, sowing this. So it's it, the, the seeding in this field and the, the other rental field too, it just progresses across. And so uh, in terms of how we deal with that, now, if it's a potato crop, we can simply furrow rate right through that residue and put our, you know, with a furrow or blade on, on the tractor, that'll be coming up, uh, and then put the potatoes in and uh, cover them back over, and then even hill them if we have to. But uh, uh, in, in general, or we could transplant right through that material, set tomato transplants or peppers, something straight through uh, that material as well. Uh, however, most of our crops are direct seeded. So in, in the case of direct seeding, or when we want really a compost application, what we really want to do is uh, be able to get good seed to soil contact or compost to soil contact. And in that case, what we will do is we will rake the mulch again, just a bed or two to the side. Maybe we'll part two beds out, come down with a, a compost application, spread it on the two beds, seed uh, or transplant, you know, if it needed a compost instead of just uh, direct into the field, uh, and then reapply the mulch that we just moved to each side. Uh, and we do that just with large rakes and humans. Not that we haven't set a rake behind one of the tractors, uh, just a tined, uh, basically a tined harrow, and moved the material off in mass with mechanical power. It basically, uh, this is a 150 foot bed, uh, so we would use the tined harrow to amass a large pile, pull it towards each end. Usually it ends up being a pile in the middle too that we would have to transfer off, but basically, uh, you can use machinery to move most of the residue or the, 
uh, the chopped straw material off, if you so desire as well. But usually we just take the root of mo uh, pulling it to the sides and then putting it back on. Uh, so this is an example of that field with uh, some squash in the forefront and some carrots and then uh, turnip or various other crops up there. But the important point here is just I wanted to show is that this field has never been weeded. Okay, those, those carrots, that is, I mean, there's a few weeds in it, but there's never been any weed control on that field. And for those of you that know how hard it is to raise carrots and weeds, uh, that is an extraordinarily uh, profitable position to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I'm going to get to. I have a seeding section coming up next. So let's see. With that level of a rye crop, it's not really more than probably, probably at max, I would think about two inches. Um. Uh, I've, we've, we've certainly furrowed through it, whether that's with the, the furrow. I haven't tried a coulter. Uh, I've certainly thought about doing that, but generally what we'll use, if we, we do need to break through it without a compost. Yeah, yeah, that's where I, right, that's where I got the idea from too. But for our purposes, all that we've needed, because mostly we do broadcast seeding too, but if we are doing seeds in rows, like we do the beets in the rows, uh, Carrots are broadcast, which I'll tell them. But yeah, the squash, good example. Uh, so it's just one uh, furrow down the bed. And all we do in that case is we just run uh, either a furrowing plow, if it's something larger, more residue, it, it opens it up. You know, it's just a V plow, it looks like, on the cultivator rig. It's not really a plow. It's a, uh, uh, what do they call those? It's just a, It looks like a tiny V plow mounted on the cultivator rig. Or if it's something like the beets, which don't really require much of a furrow, uh, uh, we simply just put a tine on the cultivator frame and just run the, you know, the, the tractor with the cultivators mounted at the right uh, row spacing and just rip with the, with the uh, just regular cultivator uh, uh, anything that would mean that things are not progressing well under the system. So, uh, and maybe it appreciates a little heat. You know, I don't, you know, I, you know I'm not, you know, I just have my own personal observations from crop production, you know, using this kind of system. So, you know, it's going well. Maybe it, you know, doesn't really mind it as much as I think it might mind it, you know. Yeah. So I'm going to get into the seeding sec sequence next, which is coming right up. Now let's get that in here. Okay. This is just an example of the loader tractor bringing it uh, down into the field. Uh, along some of the... Uh, bed edges. And this is compost delivery on the home field. Uh, a very frequent routine is to dump into three wheelbarrows, right like that, and then shoot them down the beds, the ro wheel tracks on the beds. Uh, it is faster than I have a dump cart loaded on a smaller tractor that could fit over the, tra uh, over the beds, but actually this is faster and more efficient simply to load wheelbarrows, sometimes right on the edge of the field, kind of depends, uh, or by the compost piles, and then we shoot them down and compost the bed surface, because that's really the first step towards seeding. I'm going to talk plenty more about composting and stuff in the afternoon session. Uh, these tools are how we move the compost if the bucket isn't clear, but we use uh, you know, you can pull them with refuse hooks, they're called. These tools are very common for us when we're handling materials, whether it's mulches, uh, composts. We're constantly, like I said, we never lift anything, but we're constantly pulling it or moving it. And so tined tools like this are uh, very common, obviously pitchforks too, and things like that, uh, and rakes. But this is, I believe those same two beds now composted. This is a very heavy compost application, probably from when we started up into the no-till system. The, uh, uh, 
when we first went into no-till, we had fields infested with Gallinsoga, a very fast annual weed. So the first thing that we did was to lay down a thick layer of compost. After we solarized, we put down an inch solid, uh, maybe more, to smother out the existing weed seeds that were in place from, from our previous tillage system. So we used a heavy layer of compost initially to blot out and, and keep the weed seeds that were in place uh, more or less buried under the uh, thick compost layer. Now, when we plow in uh, a new field that's in perennials and that basically has no annual weeds, we don't come in with that heavy of an initial compost application. We certainly come in with a compost application on a new field, but oh, this is actually a smothering layer of uh, compost, a thick application. Basically, a wheelbarrow at this point would cover uh, a 40-foot section of a three-foot bed, so about 120 square feet for a wheelbarrow, just as a rough idea. Over the course of time, over a year, multi-cropping, three acres, we probably use on the order of 100 tons of compost to do all this. There's not compost between every crop, especially when we're multi-cropping something short, it's quick moving, but mostly, most of the fields get at least one compost application per year. And so now this is getting into a seed sequence. I've got a couple of them coming up here. How are we doing on time? Oh, it's noon, okay. And we're, this is lunch break, right? Everybody out at noon. All right, so we're gonna open up with uh, seeding when we come back after lunch. And uh, then we'll really get cranking. And I'm gonna talk even faster. Maybe I'll have a cup of black tea and uh, you know, more words per minute. Yeah. All right, thanks everybody.